members of the Licensing Standards Committee, please come to committee room. We need a quorum. Thank you. Members of the Licensing Standards Committee, Councillors de Vermeer, Gary Janis, and De Giorgio, please come to the committee room number one. We need quorum. Would members of the Licensing and Standards Committee please report to Committee Room 1? Would members of the Licensing and Standards Committee please report to Committee Room 1? Thank you. Why, are we, why do you want to do payday loans first? Members of the committee, please have a seat. We are reconvening. The next uh, deputants, if I can have your attention, please. 
Ulla Colgrass, Kathy McDonald, Lynn Robinson, and Ian Carmichael are the next four deputants, and we'll start with Ulla Colgrass. Good afternoon, ma'am. Sorry to keep you waiting, and uh, you have three minutes. Please uh, go ahead. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Thank you for letting us continue. I'm from the York Key Neighborhood Association as, and also a member of Toronto Noise Coalition. And I would like to offer some suggestions about process and structure of the new bylaw. Um, on the central waterfront, we have a very unique perspective on noise because we attract millions of visitors every year. And these are the summer cottages of the entire GTA. Uh, we welcome all the people along the festivals, boating, sports events, and outdoor concerts. And we have around a dozen outdoor venues for music around the bay. We've been described as a canary in the mine shaft by others in town when it comes to noise. And we do have a lot of it. And it travels fast and unimpeded across the water and up the condo towers. Residents at times complain about noise invading their homes. And MLS may send a noise inspector five days later. Such a visit is useless, of course, but we understand the MLS is short of money and staff. But one serious flaw in the current noise bylaw must change. You have to place the owners on the noise makers and not on the residents. Right now, MLS responds to noise complaints by asking complainants to keep a noise log for several weeks describing the source of noise, the duration, and the loudness. And to make this exercise relevant, the complainants submit their noise logs, logs to MLS, and they must agree to be witness at a court trial to face the noisemakers. They can even be held liable for legal costs. This has played out on the waterfront with poor results. Very few people volunteer to be part of this absurd process Instead, they sold their condos and moved. The noisemakers went about their business without fine or effort to mitigate the noise. Clearly, this burden on residents must end. Instead, the noisemakers should get a visit from the MLS inspectors in, due, in reasonable time and be asked to control their noise or prove it is within the limits. Messing sound is not rocket science. Good noise bylaw models exist around the world with effective tools such as enforcement, officers ticketing offenders, counseling on mitigation plans, and fines that are not just a slap on the wrist. With just three minutes here, I can only briefly manage, ma mention other concerns about the structure of the new noise bylaw. Keep noise and health the only, the sole content of the noise bylaw as we had agreed upon in our working group extensively, and it took us hours to come to the conclusion that business development has no place in the noise bylaw. So noise and health is the content of the noise bylaw. With a welcome postponement Please of finalizing the new noise bylaw, I ask that YQ&A, Toronto Noise Coalition, and others in the working group remain engaged in the process. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Any questions from the deputant? If not, thanks so much for your presentation. Okay. <coughs> Kathy McDonald is next. So thank I you, ma'am, and I'm sorry to keep you waiting. I know that you had a, yes, a doctor's appointment. Much. I appreciate I'm sorry about the that. The timing is perfect. Please go ahead. Okay. So my name is Kathy McDonald. I'm the co-chair of the Federation of North Toronto Residents Association and a member of the Toronto Noise Coalition. Um, I've really simplified the points that I want to make and I've been I included a lot more in a letter um, that I've sent in that um, uh, sort of goes into more detail about the uh, process at the, uh, through the uh, noise working group and my list of, um, our list of outstanding issues. Um, I think many of these are getting covered. Um, 
I think in general, we support the uh, new initiatives proposed by um, uh, municipal licensing and services for further work. Um, um, a number of these are ones that we've been pushing for. Um, but um, I think it's important to provide some further directions. Um, and um, specifically in this submission, I want to add some um, uh, uh, proposals for the uh, really important uh, consultation process that will take place uh, in the uh, next um, uh, year or so. Um, I, in particular, I want to um, I sort of recommend that there, um, the consultation process um, include uh, facilitated discussions with all the relevant stakeholders um, and um, on the development of the new bylaw. But in particular, um, um, in developing uh, new and relevant uh, regulations for leaf blowers to reflect the noise impacts and the issues raised by uh, a number of people today. The staff report seems to really dis disregard um, the need to uh, deal with uh, leaf blowers, saying that um, garden operators um, need them and uh, the total emissions are really low. But um, uh, I don't think this is really a, a responsible uh, response. There are ways to develop new regulations for leaf blowers that can meet the needs of everybody. Um, uh, the, my, the second um, facilitated consultation um, needs to be around the development of the new enforcement system, which is going to be a major new program for the city, given that the police are withdrawing. Um, and uh, also because of the many current issues of the um, present program, which is understaffed and underfunded and uh, um, I think with better regulations and uh, clearer systems, the enforcement program can be much improved, but it's a big comprehensive study and uh, it has to be done. Um, and uh, finally, um, um, uh, we need to have facilitated discussions around the development of uh, mitigation plans um, for uh, 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 construction noise and noise from amplified sound um, that meets the needs of both industry and the residents. And um, I think the New York City bylaw shows this can be done, but we've got to sit down. Thank you, Mr. McDonough. Well. For your information, we do have your communication from Fontra, yeah. Yeah. and that's noted as LS members of, uh, members of the committee, LS 24.1.21. Yeah. I have two, two submissions, one on, the, on behalf of Fontra and one on behalf of um, the Toronto Noise. We do have those submissions yes. and that, we're, okay. that are with the city staff for their consideration. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for your presentation. Okay. Any questions to the deputant? If not, thanks so much for your presentation. Lynn Robinson, followed by Ian Carmichael. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. My name is Lynn Robinson. I'm the chair of the Toronto Island Noise Committee. I've been on the noise file for some 20 years now, uh, trying to uh, maintain a healthy soundscape on the Toronto waterfront. And I have spent many hours of my life working happily with MLS and partnering with them to do that. I was a member of the noise working group, the MLS working group this last year. Um, and I want to support uh, the presentation of the director of uh, MLS to this committee. We support the recommendations in it uh, for more work, uh, but there are a couple of um, supplements I would like to see made to that report, and I suppose that I'm not, I'm, I'm not an expert on process, but I guess a motion uh, from one of you good councillors might be helpful to us. On page two of the report, and I probably lost it, um, it says, uh, 
we will undertake further consultation with internal and external stakeholders. That's right at the bottom of the page. And my proposal to you is that um, we continue with the working group that currently exists. I think it's a, a very valuable tool that we cannot afford to lose. What we have on that working group are very experienced residents and very experienced members of industry. And if we're going to coexist in a very dense city, we have to figure things out together. It's not always easy, but absolutely the best solutions are going to come out of the people who are on the ground with, this, uh, with these noise problems. We want to end up with uh, what are essentially polluting industries, uh, music and uh, construction, noise polluting, um, moving toward the idea of being good neighbours and working with residents to find out how to do that. So I think we have a terrific opportunity here to continue and I ask that you help us do that. What happened with the current working group is um, we didn't do our best work. Uh, we did, it, it, we've got conflicting interests, obviously. So a group like that has to be set up and properly facilitated with really good professionals so that instead of saying, what do you think, what do you think, and people arguing, you say, okay, here's a problem. How can we solve this problem so that everyone's happy? We want to do that. The residents want to continue. Please help us. My second ask, which is more complicated, that's a simple ask. The second ask is that to manage noise in the city, we need to broaden the scope. Uh, looking at the bylaw, it's the last ditch. Nobody wants to go to court. Uh, nobody wants to wait till everybody's fighting. To manage noise, we need to get up front and mitigate. Educate, prevent, dialogue, all that up front stuff. And when we were in the working group this year, uh, of course, that was not within the scope and we couldn't talk about it. Please expand the scope. Thank you so much for your presentation. Questions? Councillor Bernstein, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, through you, uh, so are you suggesting to revamp the working group? I because don't know what the right way to do it is. I think we need more people on the working group, more stakeholders, um, people who could help with mitigation, uh, maybe economic development, um, uh, people could, oh. uh, uh, it needs some thought. Um, and the only reason, the reason I'm asking is there have been nine meetings, correct? Yes. And my impression from reading the report is no, we're not any closer to any sort of solution. A little bit. <laughs> Quit me some, um, yes. Just listening to the, the, the deputants from both sides, actually, it seems, apart from yourself, uh, it seems like there is no common ground. You know, because you're actually the first person that I actually have heard this. I'm really compromise. behind this. I talked to a few people from the music industry outside the working group, and we started to talk about how to do things. I don't think we're going to agree on everything, but I think we can agree on some really useful material. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <coughs> thank you. Any other questions? Thank you for your presentation. Ian Carmichael, uh, is he here? He left. Is the next uh, four deputants, Robert Tanner, Liz Sore, Claire Riley, and uh, Ron Jenkins. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, good afternoon, okay. councillors. Thank you for hearing me. Uh, my name is Robert Tanner. I've uh, lived and worked in uh, the city of Toronto for over 40 years. Uh, I am a lawyer, uh, but I'm, I'm not getting paid for this, so I will be brief. Uh, the, uh, I'm here to request the committee uh, uh, with respect to direct MLS or request MLS uh, two things. First of all, to reconsider its recommendation with respect to the amendment to the general prohibition uh, at Article 591-2 of the, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, municipal code. Uh, and secondly, to restore in the next draft to be presented the wording of that provision to that of the provision which is currently in force in the current bylaw. That is a very simple provision which reads, 
no person shall make, cause, or permit noise or vibration at any time which is likely to disturb the quiet, peace, rest, enjoyment, comfort, or convenience of the inhabitants of the city. A, a remarkably clear bit of, of municipal legislation. The reason I am asking that the, that wording be restored and preserved is that the proposed amendment will take away from residents their existing right to make any effective complaint in respect of noise disturbance during the daytime and up until 11 p.m. at night. Residents will be precluded from supporting such a complaint with valid evidence such as noise logs and sworn testimony in court, as they can do now. This is why this is so. According to the new wording in the proposed bylaw, no disturbance during those hours from 9 a.m. to 11 p.m. will be subject to regulation without decibel readings being made available, without decibel readings being taken and being pre presented and available in court. Those readings can only be effectively taken and received in evidence by cor in, in court from bylaw control officers. Residents do not typically own noise meters and it is highly improbable that their evidence, being of a technical nature but, not coming, from, but, but coming from a layperson, would be admissible in court if they did. Residents should not, I submit, be shut out of the process of regulating noise disturbances which affect their lives. For its part, the city, if it's serious about controlling noise, benefits from the evidence that residents gather and submit to MLS in support of complaints of violations. Essentially, residents, when they do this, are motivated by the disturbance of violations to do the legwork for the city, to gather the evidence. They won't be able to do that anymore in respect of daytime disturbances up until 11 p.m. if the bylaw is amended as proposed. MLS officers, uh, if ML officers are to become the exclusive source of evidence to support such prosecutions, its budget will have to be greatly expanded if there is to be effective enforcement. Such funding, if it were made, will be subject to cost cutting in future budgets when efficiencies are invariably sought by future administrations. And if such cost cutting were to occur, MLS will not have the resources to gather evidence to enforce the proposed new bylaw, but the citizens' right to gather and submit evidence will have been lost. That avenue will no longer be there. Even assuming sustained and sufficient funding, the likelihood that the bylaw inspectors will be able to get to a site and record the evidence in a timely way is not great. Thank you, Mr. Stanley. Questions? Councillor Burnside, please go ahead. Just very quick, I'm quick. So, you mentioned that you, you prefer the original or the current bylaw, um, but aren't laws generally better when they're concise? When they are concise? Concise. The existing bylaw is more concise, sir. So, well, um, would a baby crying uh, apply if, if, if it's disturbing my sleep in the middle of the afternoon? Uh, I, I think it improbable uh, that a baby crying uh, is going to prompt you or likely any uh, neighbour uh, to go to the trouble of, of filing a complaint uh, so. with MLS and pursuing that complaint. Uh, I think it's unlikely you would persuade MLS to exercise its prosecutorial discretion in your favour. But it wouldn't surprise you if we've had complaints about babies crying. Uh, it, it would actually, but if you're telling me that you do, uh, there is a remedy for that because, because your bylaw prosecution department has the discretion to choose whether to prosecute or not. Well, and, and, that's, I, and, that's I, the, and wouldn't you say that that's part of the, one, of the, one of the issues is what's noise to you, maybe not noise to um, a bylaw officer. What would you say about someone uh, drilling in the middle of the day, building a house or, or a leaf blower in the middle of the day? These are, are value judgments, certainly, but uh, people have a right uh, the, to, to raise the issue, to make it the subject of a complaint, and your, your prosecution's department has the discretion to decide whether to pursue that in, in a prosecution, and ultimately, and this is the way our society is organized, if such a prosecution is brought, a judge has the right to weigh the values on each side and to decide whether a conviction is warranted. All I'm saying is, do not deprive people of the right to make the complaint. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Councillor Burnside. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Tanya. Thank you. Lisa Sutter. Yes. Good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon, thank you. 
Please go ahead. Um, dear committee members, I debated coming today because I have been disheartened and disillusioned by the noise working group process and its extreme bias towards the music industry who had paid staff members attend the meetings. However, I, among other residents, dedicated a huge amount of time, research, and energy as dedicated volunteers because we are the ones who are ultimately impacted by the results of any changes to the noise bylaw. I've always understood Toronto's noise bylaws to be a set of regulations to protect the residents. My opinion is that the impact on the quality of life and health of those residents should be the number one priority of any changes to the bylaw. In addition, and within its jurisdiction, a municipal bylaw is no different than any other law of the land and should be enforced with penalties and consequences so that repeat offenders are never allowed to ignore their responsibilities and their effect on the community. So let me start with this. Why is there never enough time to do it right the first time, but always enough time to do it over, which is what we are in the process and what is being recommended now? So here are my key points. I hope you take them seriously. Recognition of the priority of a bylaw. Clear recognition that the protection of the health and quality of life for all those living, working, studying, and playing must be the first consideration for a noise bylaw. I'm not going to repeat what the current bylaw states because Mr. Tanner just stated that, but it is a critical component because the fundamental part is no person shall make, cause, or permit noise or, or vibration at any time. The second point is the owner should be on the noise makers to mitigate and minimize noise from their operation. This doesn't happen, uh, doesn't appear to happen very often with our current noise bylaws and the onus has been on the residents primarily to prove with endless noise logs that they are disturbed by these infractions. The repeat offenders blatantly ignore the noise bylaws. So let me repeat this because it's very important. The onus should be on the makers of the noise to mitigate their noise and not on the residents. The third point is the lack of confidence in the process. I attended all except one meeting. There were seven coordinators for the nine meetings, Intiaz, Vanessa, Jessica, Hamish, Carlton, Mark, and back to Vanessa. And now we have somebody new, Joanna. And an enormous amount of time was spent at the beginning with three meetings focused on the terms of reference, and then we weren't adhering to them. At the start of the process, we recommended a disciplined pro process for re-engineering a bylaw and insisted on an independent outside facilitator. There was no professional facilitator until the last meeting, and then they did not have the advantage of the history and background from the previous meetings, so had little context to properly facilitate the final workshop. Now, my fourth point is independent and recognized Please expertise on the noise committee should be throughout the entire process, and we recommended Charles Shamoon from New York City and Dr. Arlene Bronsaft. Um, and enforcement is the weakest part of this entire process. Thank you, Ms. Sutton. Any questions to the deputant? These three members, Councillor Wantam. Uh, yes, thank you very much, and thank you for your presentation. Uh, just by way of your comments about the, the, the consultation process and the, the working group process not being uh, as, as uh, constructive as it can be, uh, how would you improve that? Um, I would hire a professional consultant who understands how to re-engineer a process and because we were never sure whether we were tweaking the bylaw, um, forming a new bylaw, uh, like it was kind of all over the place whether we were advisors, I mean the word noise working group was a misnomer. And is it, uh, if, if there is no, if there's no money, and I don't know if there is or not, but there's no money for the city through this process to hire a third party facilitator, um, do you think that the community would have faith in the process moving forward? Um, I won't speak for the community, but I certainly would not have faith in the process. You need people who understand business process re-engineering, that's my background. When you're redoing a bylaw that's important as it is to the city, you need people who understand how to do that, either rewrite the bylaw or take the existing one and tweak it. And my final question is that, um, is it clear now, um, the X number of working groups under your belt, uh, with the report that is, the, is an interim status report that's before us today, uh, is it clear now that, this, that as you read it, that uh, the city staff intend to write a new bylaw uh, with uh, most likely uh, 
uh, mechanisms for increased enforcement uh, and hopefully addressing the, the, the concerns that the working group have? I'm not clear because I think parts of it are going to be rewritten, like the general prohibition, which I disagree. They, they need to leave it in. I, I agree with the gentleman previous to me that has to come back in, otherwise we have no protection at all. Um, I'm not sure what parts of the bylaw they're actually trying to, I mean the bylaw is a large bylaw, mm -hmm. so we didn't go through it, you know, section by section, um, the way they did in New York City. And it takes a long time if you're going to make effective change to do that process. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is um, Councillor Karijanis. Correct me if I'm wrong, and thank you for being here today. Did you say you have no faith in city to be able to come up with this process? I said I recommend an independent facilitator who has the skills to run a process like this to change a bylaw. So we don't have the knowledge in city staff? Is this what you're, you're saying? Well, it wasn't evident to me in the noise working group of the people that attended those meetings that we had the uh, sound engineering or the acoustical engineering uh, expertise that we needed in those meetings. Now, you said you were a professional retired uh, that we had worked in this field? I'm a professional consultant, yes. So would somebody like yourself be able to step up and help us do this? Yes, there are people who are certified consultants who understand how to do re-engineer a process. Would you be one of those consultants? Uh, unfortunately, I am restricted in what time I have available. I've invested an enormous amount of my personal. But you would be able to do that work, right? I could be able to do that. All right, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you for your presentation. Mayor Riley. Followed by Ron Jenkins and Andrea Amen. Good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon. Please go ahead. Two uh, minutes. Number 20, 17. Yes. Yeah, please go ahead. Hi. Um, yes. Claire Riley, I've resided in Ward 22 for a decade now in the same apartment building. This space is now beside an ongoing uh, Madison Group and Zig Condos development. Demolition started in December 2015. Active construction directly outside my window, a mere 12 feet away. Since two years and four months now, insufferable construction noise. This construction development truly affected quality of life and well-being and a right to enjoy my living space, and there's no doubt about this, and it's an unfortunate reality. Uh, just to let you know, this was the peaceful uh, serenity of my space before they started construction. This is now the compound that I'm looking at through my window face on, all right? After that, this uh, development is a driveway with away from my building. So to your left, that is my building, and you can see that how this envelops one driveway with away. And um, it's uh, working from home. This makes it very, very difficult. It has affected my earning capacity, thus my livelihood. Privacy is non-existent without the cost of expensive uh, window coverings, unable to open my windows during the day for fresh air because of this excessive construction noise. The intolerable freight hoist that they have, this is the freight hoist outside of my window uh, for two years. Bombardment of noise and assault on the quality of life. And it's an aluminum empty tin can. As you can see, the noise resonates because it's a little vortex that goes on, so it magnifies the noise there. And this was granted by the OMB. They gave the Madison Group and Zig Condos carte blanche to build 12 feet away, face to face, when you look out your window, this is what's happening. So 
there is no noise litigation, mit sorry, mitigation whatsoever. They are there. The noise is deafening. Uh, lastly, it's a health hazard. It's a health hazard. These are readings that I take, took 91.5, 85.5 decibels. That's above the health hazard um, uh, regulations that have been set, not only by the World Health Organization, but the City of Toronto as well, the Health Board. So I would like some legislation to manage the level of construction noise, pollution-based, and based on the Toronto Noise Coalition's April 9, 2018 submission, in particular, related to New York City's noise codes, installation of sound walls, blankets and screens, and uh, to install at least some type of noise barrier. Thank you, ma'am. Yes. Would you be kind enough uh, to share your communication with us, uh, or have you made the submission already? Uh, I can do that. I can share it. Yes. Yeah, that would yeah, be very no helpful. Problem. Thank you so much. Okay. Is, Thank you. Um, uh, our city clerk will get in touch with you. Any questions to the deputant? If not, thank you. Ron Jenkins. Followed by Andre Eamon. Uh, thank you, Chairman Dr. Palacio Sir. and committee members uh, for the attention to this issue and the opportunity to depute on it. I'm Ron Jenkins. I'm speaking on behalf of the group Waterfront for All. Um, Waterfront for All comprises more than 30 organizations and civ civic groups um, interested in preserving and enhancing the entire waterfront from east to west. And um, when we speak of noise, what we're really talking about in terms of the waterfront uh, is an area with unique challenges. It has um, an intensive mix of disparate uses, residential, commercial, cultural, educational, recreational, industrial, and, and so forth. Um, it's unique in that way. It's unique also um, that uh, it's an area where major permanent sources of noise are already established. Music venues, expressway noise, airport noise, um, festivals, and so on. Um, it's also unique as an area with some of the city's quietest locations, uh, the island, um, Tommy Thompson Park, the serene beaches along the bluffs, um, out in the east, out in the west, it's you know Colonel Sam Smith Park, and so on. And finally, it, it's unique with a natural resource of Lake Ontario itself, which, um, in noise terms, I mean it's a critical asset. It's what the what makes the waterfront the waterfront, but. Um, Noise travels particularly well across water. So in that regard, um, it's an area of particular concern. All of those considerations should um, inform noise bylaws that are formed. And there are a number of recommendations already in place, but I'd like to add that um, bylaw planning consider the unique characteristics of the city's neighborhoods and regions when forming um, uh, noise bylaws. And then uh, finally, I'd just like to point out, I think that this consideration by this committee, um, it's a committee whose mandate, according to the city website, is uh, has a, a primary focus on consumer safety and protection. And um, given that, I think health concerns relating to noise are, are paramount. Um, it's also stated as a committee with a mandate to monitor which is something a little bit more of um, a requirement than simply responding to complaints. And, and finally, um, it's a, a committee with a requirement of enforcement of standards. And um, in that case, too, then what we're really talking about is noise bylaws that should be respected and applied. All of this is a demanding task, of course, balancing uh, uses, and um, for that, the city uh, looks to your committee for imagination and uh, inventive solutions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jenkins. Any questions? 
Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. So the last uh, four de deputants that were added on to the, to the list is Andre Eamon, Edgar Caravaggio, Brian Monrad, and Spencer Sutherland. We'll start with Andre Eamon. Andre Eamon, Edgar Caravaggio, oh, I'm sorry, H. Caravaggio. My mistake, I'm sorry about that. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, committee members. Um, let me just get my notes out here. Um, uh, I'm Edge Caravaggio, board member for the National Golf Course Owners Association of Canada, representing approximately 2,500 golf courses throughout Canada uh, through the association. Um, uh, I'm here to talk uh, about the bylaw, specifically as it relates to the uh, blower regulation. In this matter, um, <clears throat> representing, I'm representing the owners of the courses in the area that would be affected by the related bylaw. National uh, Golf Course Owners Association is in support of the Department of Licensing and Standards recommendation to leave the current bylaw as is pending its further due diligence review. Uh, we thank and appreciate uh, the ongoing inclusive and fair manner with which the licensing and standards uh, department is conducting its due diligence in reviewing this matter. Uh, we believe the current bylaw strikes an equitable balance of the interests of all community stakeholders and are confident it will continue to do so long into the future. <clears throat> We believe the current bylaw through its regulations has been effective in its intended goal and uh, local course operators have adapted to its regulations with minimum impact to their prospective business pro formas and more importantly to their customers experience. This while limiting the disruption to the overall enjoyment of the surrounding residents. <clears throat> We believe the current uh, city bylaw is working as intended and should only be amended if and when there is a mutually acceptable solution. The NGCOA on behalf of the local golf course owners strongly urges this committee to accept staff recommendation on further review in this matter which we are confident will result in reaffirmation of the current bylaw until such time as new innovative solutions are developed. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Caravaggio. Any questions from the deputant? Thank you. So, ancient Brian Munrad is not here, and the last deputant to the Spencer Sutherland. Spencer Sutherland. So we are done with the deputations on this item. Now we'll go to questions to staff, starting with visiting members of uh, council. Councilor one time, uh, please yes, go thank ahead. You. Thank you very Three much. My, my questions are going to be very short. Uh, with respect to the process uh, ahead of us, um, can you clarify that the intention is to uh, is to write a new uh, noise bylaw. Uh, through the chair to Councillor Wong Tam, the intent is to make improvements and all amendments to the existing noise bylaw. I wouldn't say it's to write a completely new bylaw, but the goal is to make it an improved bylaw that has clear and clear understanding of the rules for more consistent enforcement, as well as recognizing the bylaw has been not updated since 2002 and the city and the way it functions and people live and work has changed and we need to make those changes to reflect that. Okay, so recognizing it's not uh, scrapping it all together but building upon the pieces that, are, that need improvement and strengthening. Uh, so when the community says, is it a new bylaw or not a new bylaw, whatever it is moving forward, it's not gonna be the old bylaw. That's correct. Uh, and then so and then the second question I have is with respect to the consultative process uh, I think that there's been some concerns that perhaps uh, there needs to be a third-party independent uh, facilitator 
um, that, that can be brought in to help uh, streamline the communications and to focus the discussions so you can get the, the constructive feedback that you need. Um, do you think that's a, a helpful suggestion? <clears throat> yes, it's a very complex file uh, with a number of competing interests and uh, facilitation. Um, we could use that to, to assist us in our ongoing consultations. So if, uh, if I was to move a motion or if the chair was to carry forward a motion specifically directing you to do that, um, to bring in a third party professional facilitator to help you finish the consultation process, um, you would be agreeable, is that correct? Uh, we'd be agreeable to it being part of the process. However, we do recognize that that does ha have a financial implication that um, we would have to look at further. Okay, so if the money was there, you can get it done. Uh, I would just like to clarify too. I think when we move forward with the consultation, there will be sometimes we'll be meeting with individual respect, uh, individual stakeholders that perhaps we don't need that facilitation process, but clearly when we're bringing together multiple parties with different viewpoints on this contentious issue, as it were, then definitely having that facilitation available would be of great assistance. Okay, thank you very much. That's very helpful. Thank you, Councillor Wentam. Is Vice Chair Karijanis. Thank you, Chair. Let me, uh, let me understand from staff. The only time that you will need a facilitator is when you're having more than two or three parties. Everything else, like when if you're meeting one-on-one -on -one or to, 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 to put uh, a pen and paper and drop the, the, the bylaw, you have staff that can do that. Yes, we do. We have uh, excellent research and policy development staff that uh, facilitate a number of these meetings, look at a number of other jurisdictions and see what the best practices are. While we're not necessarily business process re-engineering uh, experts, we are, uh, we are good at getting feedback and presenting a, a best opinion for you and your peers to make uh, decisions. And you will be reaching out to different cities, I would say, not only in North America, but also in Europe to see what they're doing? Uh, we have already and we will continue to, but uh, um, Canadian is, we have to do with what's in, uh, I guess, within the legislation, within Canadian legislation. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Any other questions? Deputy Mayor, Deputy Mayor, please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Three, Mr. Chair. In this, um, I'll call it the great debate perhaps of, of noise being in the ears of the beholder. Um, do you think we've identified a way yet that the city can help people, if you will, live in peace on the one hand and yet have an outdoor patio or a busker or a festival going on within that same community? I don't think we're there yet. That is our objective. And through you, Mr. Chair, and, and the cases, like I think there's a couple, of the, a couple of our first deputations who said on a street there's one individual who likes either their car stereo to blast or their stereo system to blast that um, wrecks havoc or disturbs a lot of the neighbours. Do you think we have a solution to deal with that circumstance yet? Uh, not yet, but it's something we're looking at. Um, the one-ofs are... Um the one ofs. We need to look at our at what the reoccurring ones are. That's really what we need to uh, to stop reoccurring noise uh, that's happening quite often. Okay. And do you think, in in terms of um, some of the machinery that we've talked about, uh, lawnmowers, the leaf uh, leaf blowers is the one that I think gets most attention. Um, do you think there is a case to be made for differentiating between, say, a residential person and a commercial business, where you've got a business and you've got a truck with five employees that go out and do these things versus me who just does my own backyard and that's it? Uh, through the chair to Councillor DeBarrowmaker, I think on the issue of when we look at leaf blowers for in, in particular, I don't think there is a differentiation. I think, however, also we bear in mind and we look at the volume and the impacts that this issue has had. And as was mentioned previously, 28 complaints were received in 2017. That's 0.25% of all noise complaints we receive in it, which is in excess of 12,000 complaints a year, that we don't see the need or the uh, impacts that that issue is having on the community at large. 
Um, w would you agree with me that that number probably though is, is underreported? People like myself who get annoyed, uh, I don't pick up the phone and call 311 or your office and I'm not sure if I have your cell phone but I, you know, there are people who just won't call you because their neighbor is uh, waking them up at 8 o'clock in the morning with a, a leaf floor or there's a commercial company next door. Uh, um, well, in view of the fact that we get you know, over 12,000 complaints a year on average on noise complaints and they vary for all sorts of different types of noise complaints and hours and time of day and noise types, I don't think that that's necessarily a reason why people don't call us. Okay, great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so insight, please. Mine's really quick. It's one really quick, thanks. Um, so just in, in uh, I'd like to sort of follow up on Councillor De Bearmaker's assertion which you somewhat refuted but in terms of underreporting, would it not be fair to say that every bylaw and crime and everything else is underreported because there will always be people who just don't bother and that's not unique to leaf blowers it could be it's any noise a certain percentage of people complain a certain percentage of people don't complain no it would be correct thank you thank you councillor Nunciana. Um, on page four, the, uh, the working group. So all the names that are listed on that page are, are uh, the working group members? Uh, what they represent is people who've been involved in the various meetings and you'll see a number of councillors' offices there as well. They would send staff um, to the odd meeting to see how they were going. I doubt that all of these were present at one meeting, but uh, we try to be as open as possible to right. allow people to, to give us feedback. Okay, um, now is Toronto Police, are they not uh, part of the uh, consultation? Uh, they are not part of this, but they are, we are working with them on other matters. Well, because uh, uh, I think when we have noise complaints, uh, like at three or four in the morning where there's parties and that, I mean, it's a police issue uh, because then you've got some, I don't think our MLS inspectors would wanna go in when you have 5,000 people that are disrupting a community, they want the police with them. So should they be not part of the? Um, we do work in partnership with Toronto Police and in right. particular now with the Toronto Police Transformation Task Force, we are have ongoing dialogue and meetings with them about enforcement of noise complaints of police when police should respond to them and when it's more appropriate for MLS to respond so we consult with them separately that, so they don't need to be part of the noise working group the focus of the noise working group was to look at the current bylaw and get feedback and input on the current bylaw and in short form improvements that could be made to the bylaw not about the enforcement of dealing with okay thank you thank you any other questions and if not, I think that I have a quick question here with um, regards to um, the noise working group actually that uh, the recommendations came to the committee in 2016, I believe, and given the nature of uh, the noise complaints from residents across the city of Toronto and some stakeholders as well, and the committee recommended the creation of the of the noise working group. Now, this is, it will continue with the discussions and with all of them. So I think with respect to the noise working group, we've had, as it was identified in our report, we had nine meetings with all the stakeholders and members of the noise working group. They've provided the advice and input on the bylaw uh, feedback as well. So at this point, we, we are recommending that we will continue on meeting with the individual stakeholder and representative groups, yep. but the noise working group, and we're f preparing a finalized summary document of the outcomes of that noise working group and all the meetings, and that would be then shared with the executive director of municipal licensing and standards for their consideration as we move forward with reviewing and amending the new noise bylaw. There is another component to it, and that's the um, Toronto Public Health, because they are looking also at the noise implications as it relates to the health and safety of, of uh, our city across the... Now, 
do you know if they have completed and monitoring the whole aspect in terms of the recommendations? And if so, when the report's coming forward? So Toronto Public Health staff are here, so I'll defer to them to answer that yes. question. Sure, through the chair, that report has been done and it's been reported. Our work going forward is to be on the working group along with Public Health Ontario to continue to provide input into the ways we can implement a plan. A final noise action management plan will come forward from Public Health that's more comprehensive and the bylaw would be within it, but it will be coming forward around the same time, so fall of 2019. But to be clear, both reports will come to this committee concurrently or to the City Council concurrently. The to Board of with Health that. would receive the report from Health, but yes. we certainly can make sure it's referred over to you and we will be developing the Noise Action Management Plan report with MLS. So there is that level of coordination with yeah, that's I, fantastic, that's great. Yeah, sorry, Mr. Chair. Just, yeah, I'd just like to clarify, we are working in partnership and we recognize that we both complement each other's uh, mandates with respect to enforcing of noise issues and the noise bylaw. So we are not working in isolation. We're very much engaged with each other on talking through and bring forward our recommendations in, with consideration for both. That's great, thank you. Okay, now we'll go to the speakers, visiting members. Councillor uh, Wontam, you're the first one, three minutes, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and I would ask that the, uh, the clerk can put a motion on the screen, and uh, hopefully, uh, Mr. Chair, you'll be able to take care of this for me. Uh, this motion is simply to add to the, uh, to the recommendation already before us from staff, and, and that is to ensure that the consultation process can be refined uh, with uh, independent professional facilitators to make sure that all the stakeholders are provided with um, uh, opportunities to provide constructive and focused feedback as they move towards the formation of a, uh, a new noise uh, bylaw, recognizing that the, the language to clarify, when we say new, we mean uh, dramatically modified, enhanced and, uh, and upgraded, um, and not new from scratch. Um, and the reason being, Mr. Mr. Chair, and, um, is that I want to say that uh, this has been a, a, a very large body of work, and I think that staff alluded that the noise bylaw reform, um, sorry, it hasn't been, the noise bylaw um, has not been looked at since 2002. In 2013, I, I moved a motion um, to take a look at the noise bylaw, um, at Chapter 591, thinking that perhaps we can uh, strengthen uh, its, its, its effectiveness to get the outcomes that we're looking for, just because I was hearing so many concerns uh, from the local communities that I, I serve. Um, fast forward, it's now five years, <laughs> moving on to six years now since the, the, the motion was still, was first moved. Um, and I know that this represents, this report represents a huge body of work. Um, it took a little while to get it off the ground, but here we are. Um, and, uh, and I think it's important to note that members from the, the various communities, whether it's from uh, industry or, or business, uh, and especially for the, uh, the residents who represent na neighborhood associations, uh, they've been working really hard and I believe in good faith to make sure that they bring the very best of their li lived experience, uh, hopefully to influence an outcome that will, that will bring balance and, uh, and, uh, and peace to a neighborhood at the appropriate times. And I think that uh, based on what I've heard, Mr. Chair, is that the community would want to make sure that there is a third party uh, individual that can help guide that process moving forward to the final uh, stretch because we are going to get to an outcome by the third quarter of 2019 where there is a substantially uh, strengthened bylaw. I also um, want to thank the, the community for all their hard work. I recognize that this is not easy. Uh, these are not easy conversation and that there has been tension uh, at those di different discussions. But I think, um, you know, I want to say thank you uh, for all your contributions because I know you have many other things to do um, and that the reason you're getting involved is that you actually care. But by caring, you also are investing your time in our process. I want to make sure our process actually responds to your concerns. Um, I also want to not acknowledge um, that the Toronto Police Service uh, transformational reform is one of the reasons why we're now reporting out at this particular time. Uh, because there is uh, an, an impact, because the police have been very clear that they're not going to be doing the, uh, the same type of policing the way they have, which means effectively there's going to be a downloading of what has been traditional police service onto um, the MLS bylaw enforcement 
uh, which means that we're going to have to think very carefully on the things that we're going to have to ask for in this bylaw, in or and, but also to make sure that we have the adequate enforcement body to go off and do the work. Otherwise, thank, bylaws thank you, not have effect. Thank you. Is it three minutes? Yeah, it was a three oh, okay. minutes. Okay. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. Great. Uh, any other speakers? Yes, I am. Are you speaking, Kasim? Okay. Yeah, so it's in the interest of time because we have a lot of deputants that have been waiting there, so I will just move the motion that's before, uh, uh, before us and uh, on behalf of Councillor Guantam. I'll be more than glad to do that. Saying, are we saying that we don't have staff that are able to facilitate this? Or are we saying that is, is uh, I mean, your intention is that we bring in facilitators when we have large meetings? What is exactly it? The intention of the motion is uh, it's very clear. Every time that we're dealing with contentious issues, and I have dealt with it, I don't know how many dozens of times in my community as well, city staff, they know better than any one of us around this table. First and foremost, yes, we have professionals, very professional people within our city staff, and when they feel also that we need a professional facilitator to, from the outside, we do that. So, just to make it clear, this is only to facilitate meetings. This is not reflecting on the ability of our staff to do the work. That is, is not my intention at all. Okay. Is, uh, and just to add to it, one of the questions, it had to do with the budget. We do have the budget to deal with it at the moment. Council, let me gain my, put my question. This is, what we're saying there is, is staff to bring in external facilitators when we have large contentious meetings. That does not, however, show that it said, tells the staff that they're not capable of doing the work that they need to do. I answered the question already and that's in a... That's what, exactly your meaning, right? Exactly. Okay, thank you. So can we, is um, on the motion, all those in favor? And uh, on the report as amended, all those in favor? Unanimously, thank you. Thank you everyone for coming. And Mr. Chairman, so we'll do 24-3. Next. It's uh, the next item. It's the payday loans. No, but we moved it this morning and they weren't here, so we said we're going to do it after, after the noise bylaw. There's only, right. three, there's only three deputants. Are they here? Yeah, they're here. Let's get it over and done with. Yes. Let's get it over and done with, man. Well, it's one word of caution in terms of fairness. <laughs> is we do have, members of council, we have three more items. On the next item, on the work plan for the... By the rap parlors, we have 16 deputants, and we still have the payday loan. We have three more deputants there. So, I think that we do 24 3 first. All right, there is, there is a motion to we, we did move it this morning. Councillor de Bearmaker moved it. And it got passed. Yes. Okay. So, Councillor. Yeah. Yeah. Councillor Sierra is uh, she's moving that uh, item number three be deal with immediately after the items that we just finished. All those in favor? Against. Okay. We had three deputants. And I'm going to call them is uh, Tony Erwin, Patrick Moran, and Donna Borden. I'm just uh, members of the public, and I please let's stick to the um, to the report, to the recommendations of the report, and otherwise we're going to. It's not fair to all these people that have been waiting for all day to for the next item. So please go ahead. Three minutes. Oh, do I have to turn this on or you can on now? That on there, yeah. Right, apologies. Uh, my name is Tony Irwin, and I'm with the Canadian Consumer Finance Association. 
We represent financial service businesses that provide payday loans, as well as a range of other financial services, including check cashing, installment loans, wire services, bill payments, and foreign exchange. Our member companies hold lender licenses for approximately 871 stores and online lending platforms across Canada. CCFA members provide much-needed safe, licensed, regulated uh, credit to hard-working Canadians when no one else will. Last year, some 2 million Canadians took out a payday loan at an average size of $500 for a term of 10 days, and on average, they take it out six times a year. Payday loans are used by a wide range of Canadians uh, from all walks of life, nurses, firefighters, office workers, members of your staff, who all are employed and have bank accounts. They're good people in a bad spot. Borrowers know the cost of credit is high. However, many people uh, use this service who are, are facing an emergency and have no other options. A single mother holding down two jobs who has a shortfall in income this month and needs to pay rent or buy groceries for her kids. Or a senior on fixed income who can't pay their hydro bills this month. For them, getting a payday loan from one of our members who treats them with dignity and respect is a better option than paying bank NSF fees and reconnection fees. CCFA supports fair and balanced regulation and strong consumer protection measures that are already in place uh, at the provincial level by the Government of Ontario. All of our members hold provincial licenses and pay an annual licensing fee. Loan documents are reviewed and approved by the regulator. Provincial posters displaying cost of borrowing and a cost comparison to a credit card must be displayed in our member stores, and they are inspected and audited on a regular basis to ensure compliance. The payday loan industry in Canada is not growing. Since 2012, the number of licensed locations in Ontario has dropped from 960 to 789. And with a reduction in the maximum loan fee chargeable from $21 to $15 per 100, we expect to see more closures. As regulation becomes more stringent, two things happen. More locations close and lenders will have to stop providing credit to those borrowers who have the lowest credit scores and therefore no other options. While I recognize the desire among some, among some to simply shut this industry down or significantly reduce it, I would ask you to consider what will happen to that single mother or pensioner if they can't access credit from a safe, licensed, regulated lender? And because they have no other options, are forced to go to an unlicensed, unregulated, usually online lender instead. CCFA would instead encourage the City of Toronto to focus on encouraging traditional lenders, such as credit unions and others, to offer more affordable credit options on a scalable basis as an alternative. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Irwin. Questions and... Uh Councilor Kachanis, please go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Council. There's a report this morning in the Toronto Star about a pay loan establishment that was paying people that were working, I can't remember the name or it, it, it just bring it up now, people were working on a um, temporary em employment agency. I remember the story. I didn't see it this morning, but I know it was in the media or some, some months ago Would any of well. your um, establishments, you know, or your, for your association be involved? Uh, no, that wasn't one of our member companies, and that's not, I've never heard of uh, that kind of activity, and certainly it's not something that our members would consider. So who was the pay loan company that was... I don't know the name, to be honest, Councillor, I'm not evading the question, I just don't know, but they were, they were a provincially licensed company, but they were not a member of our association. But wouldn't all the provincially licensed companies have to be a member of your association? No, it's not, not, not regulating. No, it's not mandatory. In fact, the speaker after me represents uh, independent payday loan operators. It's not a requirement to be belong to our association. So let's talk about that mother, which is the single mother that wants to make ends meet. Yeah. She comes in to, uh, to get a loan from you and she gets $300. Yeah, the average is about 500, Councillor. How much is it? 500 is about the average. 500 and $500. what did you hit with? What was the... Uh, and so the fee is $15 per 100. It's a fee-based product. $15 per 100. So 15 times five. <sighs> 75 bucks. That's correct. I mean, if I was to go to a bank and borrow money, the, bar, the, the bank will not charge me more than 3 or 5%. And if that single mother could go to the bank, she would. Or if the bank so would extend are, her credit, you are, she would. Then at the, you are <coughs> facilitating the inability to go to the bank by charging 15%. Yes. Isn't that gouging? Well, I guess you have to look at what the alternative is for that mother who can't feed her kids. What does she, it's, it's expensive, no doubt about it. But what's the alternative if you have nowhere else to go and you need to fix your car to get to work to get paid or you need to be able to pay for a medical bill that's not covered under your benefits if you have benefits? So what, if we what's put the, what's you the, out of work, then it will be the loan sharks that the, it's the underworld. 
We certainly, and I didn't say it because of our shortened time, but we get more calls in our office now than ever before from people who are, go online, they call us to find out whether the company is licensed, if they're one of our members, because either they've been scammed or they think they're going to be scammed. So either it's, it's companies who have no intention of giving you a loan at all, uh, and they ask you for all kinds of fees up front, so we tell people never pay money to get money, uh, or it's a circumstance where they will get a loan, but they'll get it at far worse rates, the company is located offshore, there's no recourse for law enforcement in so Canada. You, you help the people avoid those loan sharks, quote unquote. Yes, sir. At 15%. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Councilor saying. Thank you. Through you, do you get a lot of defaults? Uh, we do. Uh, there, there are a significant number of defaults. I would say, though, that our members work with their customers on extended payment plans, working out, you know, working out some sort of arrangement so they can repay that loan. Uh, the, the initial charge-off rate and the default rate are two very different numbers because our, our members recognize that people are in bad spots. And simply just saying your loan's in default and not being compassionate or trying to help them out doesn't serve anybody. Well, it's not, probably unsecured as well, so you're out of luck if it defaults. Correct. So um, the other question, I think you said it was $500, and was it an average of 10 days? Uh, the average term of a loan is about 10 days. The person repays it in Right, so it's just sort of get people to the next paycheck or whatever the case is. Um, and I would assume that one of the reasons the rates are perceived as high or are high yep. is that uh, compared to a bank that usually deals with more, a larger loan, Correct. it's also over a period of time where they have that upfront administrative costs um, covered over a period of time, whereas you still have the same administrative costs we setting it up, mm -hmm. but you're only, it's only a 10-day period. So it has that, that's right. that why it's one of the reasons it's reflected in that rate? It is. The loans are costly to administer. Uh, you know, there are there's collection costs or technology costs, uh, the store infrastructure, paying people. There are all kinds of costs that go into it. The other one, too, of course, is our members are not accessing credit uh, or, sorry, capital from banks to lend to their customers. So right. our cost of capital is a lot higher than it would be at a bank also. Right. You're not getting the overnight lending rate. No, we're not. That's what you're saying. Uh, okay. Correct. And then the last question. So I was a little unclear, though, in, in terms of... I know you don't want uh, the government to put your uh, clients out of business, but in terms of this, uh, the item before us, are, what's your feeling on the, the licensing? Well, I think, uh, and certainly the speaker after me will speak more because he represents smaller lenders for which paying a second licensing fee on top of what the province charges us could well make it more difficult for them to operate. They are small business people. It affects my members too, but they're larger, so perhaps uh, it's not, a, not as onerous. Uh, one thing that I would say, and Councillor, thank you for asking, that we're concerned about is there's a recommendation that licenses be non-transferable. So if someone has worked hard, created a business, invested in the business, and then wants to sell it, they're unable to do so according to this proposal, and I think that's uh, problematic. I don't think that's fair for someone who may want to sell that business to someone else who wants to operate it, but under this proposal they would not be allowed to. Okay, so i got 30 seconds. Why do you think they made it non-transferable? Well, I pr presume because there's a desire ultimately to reduce the number, and if you can't transfer the license... That's the end game. I presume so, yes. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Deputy Mayor Rivera Mieke, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, and uh, through you, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much for coming in today. And I'm, I'm, uh, I'll have to say I'm wrestling with the whole report and, and all the things that are contained in it. And you, you mentioned the single mother who might need some help and gets the payday loan. Um, and and uh, I'll say your perspective is having these payday loan companies actually helps the single mother. Absolutely. But, but you make her poorer by going to your members than if she went to a, a credit union or a bank. If they would extend credit, I could agree with you, but they won't extend her credit. So would you agree that, the, again, I, I would think that the best way we could help that single mother you gave as an example, if there was some way to keep her out of your stores, every would be, everyone would be happy because that, that single mother would be better off financially if she never stepped foot in your stores. I think that more options are always better, Pardon Councillor. Me? I think more options are always better. And if the, there, I've had this conversation with United Way representatives and across the, you know, other parts of the country who have said essentially what you just said. But they went, they went further and said, but we're not there today. We'd love to w live in a world where you guys aren't needed. But, you're, but that's not where we are. Maybe a day will come when that's the case. But until that time comes, we need this industry because there are, are, are not options for people. There are not a range of options for that single mother that all of us in this room, or most of us in this room, could avail ourselves to at any given moment. 
They cannot. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any other questions? If uh, not, I have a couple of questions. Sure. Don't you think that uh, these financial institutions are preying on the most vulnerable people out there and uh, people in need, the poor, the most disadvantaged, that they cannot, literally speaking, open a checking account in any financial institution? I think that what's common amongst all people who use our industry is they are, they have been told every, they've been told no everywhere they've gone. They've gone to a bank, a credit union, family and friends in, a, in an emergency situation, all of whom have said no, we can't help you. And then they're left with what do they do? And they come to this industry because this industry says yes, we will help you. It is not the, in, there's not in, in our industry's interest to loan people money every two weeks for the whole year, to loan them more money than they can repay. It wouldn't be a good business model if we were to do that. So it is in our interest to try to loan the right amount of money to the person who comes in, an amount that's sustainable. That doesn't mean we're perfect. I wouldn't say that we're perfect. Uh, there, are, there are circumstances that uh, should be improved upon. We do have people in the construction industry, for example, undocumented workers and uh, who are doing precarious work at the same time and not having decent people that they're paying taxes, yep. they're working, their kids are going to school, but uh, because there is no alternative for them, the only option that they have is to go to these financial, financial institutions that pay them, where is if you were on the other side, how would you look at this? Well, you know, and it's an interesting question you raised, Councilor. I mean, I've talked to people who have used the service. Uh, you know, I, I, I have gone into stores, I've talked to customers, uh, and they've told me their stories, and they've explained how, you know, they understood that being in this is not intended to be a 26 uh, week of the year situation. They would come in, they would get the loan, they had, they had jobs, uh, good jobs, but you know, I think we could all agree Ontario is an expensive place to live and Toronto is an expensive city to live in. And it is often not enough. So they would get a loan, they would gradually then borrow less. Thank you. Get themselves yes, out I have just a few more seconds. With regards to the locations, sure. why is it that um, these payday locations are very close to, let's say, to bingo halls and places where the most vulnerable people go there? and they become victimized twice, not only in terms of betting, going to bingo halls, for example, but also they had to pay heavy price by giving up or selling their paycheck in advance. How do you see that? Is there some level of conscience somewhere? Uh, there absolutely is. I, I would, I, would uh, I guess, uh, take issue with, uh, uh, the, the, the victimize uh, language. I don't think we, we, we victimize or prey upon people. We help people who can't get it elsewhere. And this is an option for people. This isn't like auto insurance where we all have to have it and we may not like it, but we have to have it. This is not the only option. I, we welcome as many options as possible for people. Our industry locates where people can get to, it's easy for transportation, uh, you just lots, like lots of other retail businesses where they can get find space. There's all kinds of reasons, but we don't, we don't look at some of the reasons that some accuse us of doing, that's not how we decide where our stores are going to be placed. I was referring to the locations one after the next within sure. a radius of one kilometer, you have too many. My last question is, hopefully you can answer this quickly. Sure, I'll try. The, it's been legislated that the pay shouldn't be more than $15. Why is it that the, all the signs all across the payday locations are still $20 and they keep on charging that? And that was supposed to be re retroactive to January the 1st of this year. Why is it that we keep on with those signage out there? Well, you're talking about the signs that are advertising for yes, lower rates? which is, would be misleading. Yeah. Uh, well, those are, those are, that's obviously those are, uh, those are rates that uh, companies, uh, you know, promotions that they offer. Uh, why are they doing that? Because the province hasn't, hasn't uh, said that it can't happen anymore. I would say that during the last round of uh, review with the provincial government, we recommended that those, that, that no longer be permitted to occur. The provincial government did not follow through on that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Patrick, uh, 
Mohan Omohan. Next speaker. Sorry if I mispronounce your last name. Good to have you here. Thank, Thank you for Thank you very coming. much. Yeah, my name is pronounced Moen, like Moen the Lawn. Thank you. But that's okay. You have uh, three minutes. I don't care what you call me, just don't please call me late for dinner. Sorry to keep you waiting. Please go ahead, three minutes. Hi, thank you. My name is Patrick Moen, and I'm the president of IPLAC, the Independent Payday Loan Association of Canada. We represent all the little guys, unlike Mr. Irwin, my predecessor, who represent, represents the larger companies, the money marts, cash monies. Based on regulations, both provincially as well as now locally, being imposed upon us, I'm sure you'll naturally see a reduction in license renewal from our membership. The little guys can't withstand the additional licensing fees and the lower rates. It's just impossible. Larger companies can because they have scale. It's like banking. Based on their size, Money Mart and Cash Money, the big guys, are not affected by these punitive legislative and regulatory changes. They have deep pockets and now are offering installment loans, which we are avoiding as it becomes yet another long-term debt for the same consumer, adding to other long-term debt they currently owe to banks, credit card companies, further putting them into harm's way. As we have argued, our fees are not and should not be looked at as an APR, since nobody I'm aware of ever borrows 26 pay periods per year. According to Ontario government stats, on the average, consumers will borrow six times annually. Having said that, installment loans get the consumer into a long-term debt, perhaps never to be repaid, which is precisely the point for the lender. Just as in the case of Visa and MasterCard, the banks never want you to repay the full balance on a monthly basis. They have even deeper pockets than the money marts and cash monies. They want their money fully deployed all the time to maximize revenue. If you have a visa balance, for example, of $1,500, and you only pay the minimum payment, which well over half Ontarians do, it will take 67 months to retire that balance, and the interest will be $1,172.67 over those months. Having said that, with reduced access to payday loans based on fewer proprietors and locations, consumers will always find another way and in this case, they'll be utilizing, as Tony Irwin said, online and largely unregulated lenders from offshore to meet their individual needs. If we're not here, regulated, licensed, and overseen, who knows what's going to happen to the consumer? They are going to obviously be in a much worse position than what the perception of some people is now that they're in. One example for, for you to consider as well is hydro bills. If you are in a position where your hydro is terminated, disconnected for non-payment, of which 60,000 consumers in Ontario were, were cut off in, in 2015, it will cost $120 for that disconnection and another $120 to be reconnected. For a $400 bill, that would have cost $80 at $21.00, and now it's going to cost $60.00. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Questions and uh, yeah, a few questions, and we we'll start with uh, Vice Chair Kajanis. Thank you, sir. You said you represent the independent um, uh, individuals. Correct. I asked the same question of your pre the person who spoke before you. There was a story in the Toronto Star. Are any of those independent individuals the ones that uh, the the uh, the uh, factory is using to pay uh, the workers? I'm not aware of that article in the Toronto Star. I was here at 8 o'clock in the morning and I have not read the Toronto Star today. All right. Um, your um, organizations, they charge 15 percent? No. $100? We charge $15 per hundred borrowed. And that's for how many weeks? Largely it's a bi-weekly loan. So about 30 percent of our customers are paid monthly. So if that was to be put bi-weekly at the $100, you end up making 390 percent for over a year. Uh, if, in fact, someone was to borrow 26 pay periods per year, no, but that would be... No, but $100 will generate, when you keep putting it out there, will generate 390%, circling different borrowers. Correct. Thank you. So what's the difference between you folks being legitimate and a loan shark? I don't think the loan shark would charge 390% per year. That's the only difference I've First of all, first of all, first of all, 
uh, we do not have customers that are in any way intimidated or are forced to pay anything other than what our stated rates are. And as I stated clearly before, the other, uh, everyone from utilities to visa rates, you could also ask why visa is 23 percent when, when the Bank of Canada rate is Visa three. is 23 percent per year, not 390 percent, correct? Yeah, correct. And they never want you to pay it off. You know, I, I was reading a story, uh, CNN, and this was Amanpour, and it reads, Farmer sells wife to pay debts in rural India. That says to me a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Is um, Councillor Burnside next? Uh, thank you. Uh, through you. I think we heard from Mr. Irwin or somewhere that the number of payday loan um, operators actually decreased. Yes. And I believe that was before any sort of government regulation. It's just how business has gone. Uh, no. Uh, since the Ontario government reduced our rates to $18 as of uh, j uh, January 1st, 2017, and then $15 per hundred as of January 1st, 2018. The, largely the independents in our association have turned in their licenses or not renewed. Sort of uh, faded away. Okay, so you would, so, and that number, quote me if I'm wrong, is somewhere around from 900 to 700, give or take? Somewhere in that area. Yeah. So about, uh, what's that, 20%? Uh, yep. Somewhere around 20%. Okay, so I'm a pretty simple person, but if, the, the rates have gone down that you're able to charge, and albeit they seem they are high, there's no question about that, but if they've gone down and uh, operators have gone out of business, um, this idea of gouging might be a little bit hyperbolic. Yeah. I would tend to agree with that. Thank we you. do not gouge. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, I do have a question. And you did mention that um, these payday locations and loans usually are no more than five or six times a year. Mm -hmm. So my question to you is, uh, and I know this from people that they have complained directly to my office and I've seen them, undocumented workers. Undocumented workers that, uh, that are within the construction industry, that they have no other place to go because they are undocumented, they don't have the legal documents to open a checking I'm account. Sorry, I can't hear. I, uh, I'm talking about undocumented workers that they don't have the paperwork yes. to open uh, a checking account with a major financial institution. So these undocumented workers, literally speaking, for example, I'll give you a location, St. Clair and Northwestern Road, one of them. They go there every, for every single pay check that they have. And that, that means 26 times a year. So, the, so is, how do you explain that? Where is the rationale so the to your comment? So the, I, I, I'm, I'm hard to hear. Uh, Councillor Nuciara, if, uh, please. Uh, so I, I heard, I think I, I understand what you were asking me, but um, so you're saying that undocumented workers would receive a paycheck. As an example, yes. And they would go to a payday loan outlet and they would cash this check that they get? Because they have no, nowhere else uh, to go because and they, they don't create have a bank some account? sort of bond with that. Because they don't have a bank account? Is, am I following That's that? right. Okay. So that's a different product. That's called uh, our check cashing product. We also cash checks. So that we do for 2.9%. So if you have a $1,000 check, it's going to cost you 29 bucks. $29. Yeah. Okay. And if you have a $100 check, it's going to cost you $2.90. Now, cash the check. Now, if you lend them in advance, and then they have to pay the fifteen dollars for every hundred dollars. For a loan, yes, that is for an extended period of time. For example, the banks uh, will hold paychecks. If no, no, I do, with, I do get it. Right. I, I do get it. I, I know what I'm talking about from that perspective. Yeah. What I'm trying to get at is to the three hundred to the three hundred ninety percent interest, literally speaking, that most of these people are paying, but somehow it's being justified. I'm trying to understand. It's not 390 percent. No one borrows 26 times a year. If you have a paycheck, Sir, you're I can not assure you 100 percent, and I'll be speaking at City Council on that. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. 
Thank you. Donna Borden. Donna Borden. Oh, great. Oh, I can see it. Oh, no, that's not good. There we go. I don't, I've left it. I've given you this off. Okay, that's. Okay. Okay, great. So, um. You have three minutes. Please go ahead. Sure. My name is Donna Borden. I'm an ACORN member and co chair of the East York chapter. Thank you for letting us speak to you today about this very important matter. We are here to support. Uh, the licensings and the, the licensing and uh, limit of the payday lenders in Toronto. ACORN has been working on this issue since 2004 to regulate and to find alternatives to payday lenders. This is why ACORN is calling for fair banking and for an anti-creditory lending strategy. ACORN is calling for all levels of government to step up and do something. So we have our, our list of um, our platform here and from the city we're asking for the city of course to do the lending for the, the licensing and the risk so that we can restrict and also provide um, to support to the other levels of government for for alternatives. We also are asking for uh, the city to help us and to, to, to reach out to the provincial government for to extend the loan uh, the loan payments from 42 to 62 days uh, to ban any rollover loans. They have uh, rollover loans now. It's, there is a regulation for it, but it's not, um, it's not working. <coughs> to create pr protection for installment loans and rent to owns and title loans, and to support the creation of uh, alternative and low income products. And for the federal government to mandate the banks to provide low interest credit, mandate the banks to provide low interest overdraft protection, mandate the banks to provide no holds on checks, to lower the NSF fees from 45 to 10, to create again alternative lenders such as postal banking, maybe credit uh, credit unions, um, and again we're working on a creating a national anti-predatory lending strategy into a real-time database, both for provincial and the federal government, that will stop the rollover loans, and to uh, amend the criminal code from 60% to 30%. There's a summon, and we're asking the city if they could um, support this, and to reach out to uh, the federal government and the provincial government and to support this. And um, again, we're here to support your licensing and the restrictions and the licensing of the number of payday lenders. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Borden. You. And we have your communication as well. Uh, questions um, from visiting members? Answer one time, please uh, go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. I wanted to just ask a, a questions to clarify um, the, the position of uh, a 15 I think it's fifteen percent. Fifteen dollars. Sorry, fifteen dollars for every one hundred dollar borrowed. There was some numbers bantered around that that is that it, it really equals fifteen percent. But uh, but that's over one week period. Uh, you have calculated somewhat differently. Because they calculate it to. We've had um, various financial people who study this. That it is up to over four hundred percent. It works out to be that because yeah. it's like short term loans are fifteen dollars per one hundred. Yeah, so it's so so it was misleading somewhat when uh, when it was suggested that for every one hundred dollar borrowed and fifteen dollars repaid, that really it's fifteen percent loan. It's closer to a four hundred percent. Yes, loan. yes. Right. So when there is an equation of the the credit card bills being perhaps charged at twenty two or twenty three percent annually, there we're now comparing a four hundred percent loan to a twenty two percent loan. Uh, on your credit card, correct? It's annually, for it's, it's yearly, yeah. So it's like, yeah, you're just, it's it's different. It's very, yeah, it's really different the way they calculate it. And, and thank you, that's that's helpful to clarify. Yeah. And uh, and also the, the concerns around, um, you know, why does it seem to be, uh, a, why is there a clustering effect with the payday uh, lenders? Why do we see perhaps 10 on, on, on one block? And in some neighborhoods, for example, I represent Rosedale, I can't find a payday loan lender mm -hmm. anywhere. But if I go down to my communities along Young Street, just south of Bloor, I see all of a sudden, you know, probably 15 of them mm -hmm. within a two block or, or three block radius. Why do they, why do they come and cluster together? Well, we think, well, there, there are reasons, of course, they do go to the areas that have the, the lower income. 
but we also find it because there is um, there was bans placed on the rollover loans that they can't roll over one loan. It's like if you owe money, say to Money Mart, for instance, and you go back in a two week and you can't pay them off, they're not allowed to roll it over into a new loan, which they were doing it before, which included additional fees. So now what they can do is they can send you across the street. Now I know at Young and Bluer they have two Money Marts. There's one is open 24 hours. Why it needs to be open 24 hours? I don't know. There's one across the street. They can just send them across the street because their systems aren't integrated. That's why we're asking for the database. So they can just say, well, you go across the street and borrow the money from them and then pay us off. So then you're just, and then there's still additional fees. You're just rolling it over into a different company. And so do you think that's part of the business model of the payday lenders is to co-locate in, in, in small geographical areas to, to lend out a little bit of money at, at very high interest rates, but then to send you across the street so that so that, you, that they spread out the risk, number one, but also the fact that you're constantly bouncing from location to location. And I, well, I think too, it's, it's, it's uh, they pick an area where there is other payday lenders because they know that if they don't get it from one, then somebody else will just go across the street if they're desperate. That was last, last question. Thank you. Any other questions? Deputy Mayor De Vermeke, please. Great, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much for coming in today. Um, I'm going to just add up your your point plan here. It's two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. You've got about fourteen recommendations for action at both the city, Ontario, mm -hmm. and federal uh, levels of government. Um, are you suggesting that the payday loan companies shouldn't exist? Because this uh, seems to me that you're making recommendations on how to make them function better, if I can use that word, or or fairer. No, what we're doing is because we know with our members, because there, we have several members that are underbanked, like like the gentleman was saying that there's people who can't go to banks. So we know that they need to use this service because there's no alternative. There's nowhere else they can go to. There's no credit unions. There's no, there's no banks they can't go to borrow this money. So we know we don't want you to completely eliminate them at this point because we know that our, our red, like members still need it. But we would like to provide alternatives and eventually just slowly start, you know. But we think that being stricter on them and providing uh, more licensing and uh, databases and that type of thing will actually help to provide so that people are getting in the cycle of debt where they're just re you know, renewing over and over and over again. And do you think if, if um, one of your recommendations for the federal government, but we're all, yeah. I'm putting, lumping us all together as yeah. government, um, is an idea such as postal banking? Yes. And I assume there's a postal bank probably in every shopper's drug mart there is. ever invented. Yeah. So if, if a, um, I'm going to call it a better or fairer or lower interest um, um, regime was created through the postal banking, then that might actually eliminate the money marts of the world. Well, the good, the thing about what we found about postal banking is there's a post office everywhere. Even the small towns have them. But some small towns don't have banks but they have payday lenders. So people are going to them out of necessity. They have no other choice. So if, they're, if they had postal banking, then they have the option to go to the post office and do their banking there and cash their checks. Then to pay, and I know the gentleman was saying it was $29 for $1,000, but still $29 if you don't have a lot of money, that can help buy bread and milk and, you know. So yeah, so it's that's why we were suggesting the postal banking. Okay, great. and. Um, why do you think um, a corporation like Money Mart or some of the other companies can actually make a profit locating at Young and Bloor and scattered all over the place and it's almost every plaza in Scarborough has yes. a payday loan company. Why do you think they can make money with their little offices, which I hardly ever see anybody in with their low volumes? Um, yeah. Why do you think they can make money but a bank can't do the same thing or a credit uh, union? can't do the same thing. Well, I think the banks could do the same thing. They just, for some reason, don't want to focus on, they, they feel it's a big risk. The banks, a lot of the banks invest in a lot of these companies, too, what we found. But they just feel like uh, they uh, they have to charge. They don't want to take the risk. I think the banks don't want to take the risk, and they don't want to provide the services. I think they can. They're, they, they just chose not to. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, uh, Thanks so much. Okay, and we are done with the deputations now. We'll go to questions to staff. Questions to staff. If in the interest of time, okay, that's great. Speakers, 
Councilman Sierra. Uh, and Very quickly, I would. Councilman Wentham, please. Yeah, thank you very much. I want to just thank staff for, uh, for their work so far, and I want to also thank uh, and acknowledge the leadership of Councillor Nunziata, who I recognize has moved multiple <laughs> motions over uh, a, a a grand stretch of, of, uh, of, of time, and that uh, goes into years at this point in time, trying to get in front of this issue, um, but also knowing that there are limitations around jurisdiction of who actually has control over uh, this particular um, uh, sector. And, uh, and I, know, I know that it's not been necessarily easy, which is why it's taken so long, but I do want to acknowledge that we've reached a milestone at the very least um, with this particular report, uh, and hopefully with uh, the next phase of work to come uh, because in the communities that I represent uh, oftentimes uh, when people think of Toronto Centre Rosedale they think of Rosedale or they think of the wealthy parts of Yorkville um, but I also represent communities that um, have we have one of the poorest postal codes in the entire city in the downtown east and uh, and and much of the commercial activity that I'm now seeing along Young Street uh, has been somewhat discouraging. Um, and, and what we've noticed is that there's been a dramatic increase in, in criminal activity at the same time as we're seeing the, the payday uh, lenders come into our neighborhood as well as the pawn shops. And, uh, and it is not, um, it has not gone unnoticed in our neighborhood. So I do think that uh, there, require, there is uh, a requirement for, uh, for more, um, uh, a, a clearer regiment of, of regulations, but also what we are looking at is the systemic issues of people who are precarious, who are low waged, uh, who oftentimes are underbanked, which is why they're in this situation. And the last thing that we need to do to them is make them pay more and, and, uh, than, than the average citizen. And, uh, and also to confine them further into this spin cycle of poverty, which is grossly unfair. So they do need greater consumer protection and not... Thank you, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, Councillor Wantam. Uh, the next speaker is Councillor Musiara. You have the floor. So now both of them are synchronized. I just did it. Okay, hey, let, me, let me start for you again. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Um, so I'll move the recommendations uh, in the staff report, but I also have a, a motion. Uh, I'm not going to read it all out to you, but it, it actually um, just um, in, the, in the, um, the briefing note that we received from ACORN, so it's, it's actually the, um, the um, recommendations that were moved by ACORN. So that's all incorporated in, uh, in my motion. So I'm not going to read it out. Um, so members, um, if you will recall a couple of years ago that Councillor, uh, Councillor Wong Tam, it's, it's in the briefing note that you have here. That's what it is. Um, Councillor Wong Tam and I put forward a motion in council and it was carried unanimously on the issues that we were having with payday loans, and maybe it was longer than that. Uh, we've had um, numerous um, meetings with, um, uh, I've had community meetings, and uh, we've had our MP and our MPP that attended the meetings as well. So I know that I speak on behalf of my constituents, including the consumers. Now, um, the, the issue, the issue with the payday loans, I know in my ward, maybe other members of council don't have that issue, but I have approximately 20 or more in my ward, and they're all within a block. Um, a lot of them, uh, in my opinion, are nothing but loan sharks. Uh, they, um, they, they, they definitely prey on the poor. Um, some of them in my ward as well, they sell, buy and sell gold. Uh, which is also a pawn shop. Um, I, I had my house broken into a few years ago, and the first thing the police officer said to me is, go to your local payday loan, they probably have your jewelry. Um, so in these areas, there's really, really uh, problems. In my community, my, uh, my constituents, um, they are, have been complaining about the number of payday loans that we have in the community. Uh, with the dollar stores, and you know, it, it, they, they open up in areas where it's the poorest because they feel that the, the, the business is there, they don't have a choice, so they're gonna go to, the, um, to, to these establishments. And 
I know, I know that the, the people, the consumers that are using, and I've spoken to them, the ones in my ward, they, they don't support, they support what we're doing. Uh, they support it, ACORN represents them. And last year, I made a deputation to Queen's Park on behalf of the city, on behalf of the city manager, uh, to ask the province to move, uh, regu uh, to move uh, regulation. And I did speak uh, um, on behalf of the city, and I'm very pleased that the province actually listened to us because they moved the recommendation that the city of Toronto has, had requested. So, and just last week, in one of the payday loans in my ward, there was a shooting, a woman was shot, and they, they went in to rob the payday loan for $300, somebody was shot. Um, this is what's happening in the community and we need to be serious and we need to be aggressive and zero tolerance. Thank you. Questions to the mover? Thank you. First of all, can you bring that back? Uh, Councilor Bernstein. Thanks. Um, so, um, you mentioned you went to, to Queen's Park. I just want clarification. Were any of your requests uh, of Queen's Park a year ago in here? Or are all these, are all these new requests? I made at Queen's Park where, there, where the recommendations that, um, uh, that's in the staff report. Okay, so Queen's Park. But to limit the, to, but to, on page. So these, this, this is all new is trying what I'm getting at. Well, this is just requesting the province and the federal government, but if you look on the second page, as far as limiting the number of payday loans in the city, um, that was part of my de uh, Okay, yeah, which is being done, okay. And sorry, and then your first point, the city council support the creation of alternative low interest loan products. Is that a general statement that's followed up with concrete action in two yes. and three? Yes. So it's not the city actually doing it's anything, it's actually asking the province and the two federal and government three. to. Yes. Okay, thank you. Any other questions to the mover? or speakers. Speakers, uh, Councillor Janis, please go ahead. Three minutes. Three minutes. Thank you, Chair. Chair, I'm gonna read you, I'm gonna read uh, an article that appeared in CNN, and it reads as follows. This is in India. The cattle slowly drag the old-fashioned plow as a bone-thin farmer walks behind, encouraging them to move faster with a series of yelps. In the scene from old times, but still the way many farmers operate in, in rural India, where the harvest often determines feast or famine. The region is called Bundarkhand, spanning the two northern India states of Uttar Pradesh and Maindra Pradesh. It's here that drought, debt, and desperation have pushed people to extremes. To survive the bad years, some farmers say they turn to the Pushawala, Hindi for the rich man who lends money. Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Chair, um, and it continues, farmers say the loans from these uh, unofficial lenders usually come with very high interest. When the interest mounts up, lenders demand payment. Some farmers work as bonded laborers for a lifetime to pay off their debts. Others here, they say because of the years of little rain and bad harvest, they are forced to give money lenders whatever they ask for. Sometimes that includes their wives. We got lenders and they confess that they charged close to 390% per year. Nowhere else in any other industry do you have that kind of a turnover. This is certainly borderline what it's called in India, the Paisawala. Chair and, and colleagues, I'll tell you, this needs to be regulated. I'm supporting Councillor Naziata's motions. I think that we need to, uh, bring this industry into um, constraint. I think this industry needs to understand that they cannot charge the vulnerable 390%. Stores are not open at the Bridlewood Path. Stores are not open at Forest Hill. Stores are not opened in areas where there's affluency. Stores are open in areas where people are poor. They prey on the poor, they gouge them, they hit them, and instead of help giving them a hand up, they end up draining whatever they have and they're driving them into bankruptcies. So I will say that it's about time that we stand up to the Pashawala, the um, rich man who lends money and say to them enough is enough. 
and we've got to make sure that uh, the vulnerable and the people that are risked, we protect them. Having um, lender stores across the street from each other and saying, well, go get from him money and come and pay me back, is like robbing Paul to pay Peter. Enough is enough. I think we heard enough stories. I think ACORN certainly brought this to our attention, and I'll certainly be supporting Francis Nanzi uh, Councillor Nanziadov's motion and other ones that looks after this rich man. Thank you. Thank you. Any other speakers? Deputy Mayor, Deputy Mayor, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I'd like to thank Councillor Nanziata and the, uh, the ACORN for putting before us a set of recommendations that I think is very, very good. Um, I've wrestled, you know, with this issue about the payday loans because uh, they're all over my ward. I'm Scarborough Centre. It's a working class neighbourhood. Uh, they're, you know, like Shoppers Drug Mart. I, I don't know if they're in every single plaza in my ward, but they're uh, almost there. Um, and I don't think in the end people really benefit by going into them. But I've listened to all the deputants and I'd like to thank all the deputants for coming. Um, because uh, I think the industry has said to us, well, if it's, if it's not going to be us, it's going to be somebody else. And I have to think, uh, you know what, I, I think they have a point. Uh, if not them, who? Uh, I think these recommendations that ACORN and Councillor Nunziata have put forward might help answer that question. Um, ACORN, who has a stellar reputation for advocating for uh, lower income communities, um, actually said to us, we don't want to put them out of business, we don't want you to ban them, we want better regulation. And they may debate for hours back and forth on what those regulations should be, um, but I think they're here. We can't, uh, I don't think, ban them because they're allowed preven with, through provincial legislation. Uh, so I support the staff recommendations to cap them where they are now, to go and do more research and uh, hopefully come out in a, in a way that um, how we address poverty in this city is going to be a big challenge. My preference would be that a single mother, as the example that was given by one of our, our deputants, that the single mother never has to go into that payday loan because she can go to a post office and do banking or she can go to a local bank and there's other mechanisms for her or maybe through our food banks or through charities or, or through the United Way, uh, maybe through our social services. But there is a reality out there that people uh, are walking into these companies in my ward and using them every single week of the year. So if, uh, if our recommendations help reduce that cost to people, because I think those people should be able to go to other institutions and get more reasonable interest rates. But for whatever reason, as the uh, ACORN rep said, maybe banks just choose not to. I'm surprised because it seems like it's very profitable. Uh, so I don't have all the solutions on how to end poverty in the city of Toronto. I don't have all the solutions on how to eliminate payday, payday loan companies. Uh, but these recommendations I think are, are allowing us, which is a very small government, dealing with a very big problem, to play the role that we think we should play and try to cap them today, study them and come back, I guess, next year in 2019, whoever is on council, and try to w wrestle with this uh, some more. And again, I'd like to thank Councillor Nunziata for her uh, work on this item, going to the provincial government and getting some better legislation passed. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Any other speakers? If not, I'm just uh, going to say a few words. Yes, and uh, I would like to take the I thank the deputants and especially Akon for um, coming down and to speak to something that's extremely important to all of us and to residents uh, as a whole. We, I want to thank city staff for this comprehensive report. And yes, I want to thank Councillor Franz Nunciara for bringing forward this uh, to the forefront and actually through a notice of motion at city council back in 2010 a motion came forward and ever since, and we've been trying to, to make sure that uh, uh, her recommendations were part of the working plan and, and we're going to deal with during this term of council. So I'm glad that we're dealing with that at the moment. Now, one of my concerns is with, the, with these um, payday locations. I do have a number within an area that's a neighborhood improvement area. And, uh, and that literally breaks my heart when I see people lining up 
and um, and uh, the way I see it, that's a real crime. The worst uh, shark, shark loaning ever seen. Uh, these financial institutions, and uh, in my opinion, they do prey on the most vulnerable in society, on the poor, the most disadvantaged, those that uh, don't have another place to go but just to go and literally beg and sell the next couple of weeks and taking away the food from their own kids. They prey on those that uh, they cannot open a checking account somewhere else because they are either undocumented workers that uh, they don't have the paperwork that's required to open those accounts. And uh, so because of some restrictions within the immigration and um, regulations, they can't get to it. So that's a problem that um, the way I've been actually, I have heard loud and clear from constituents and people who are being victimized, not only once, one from uh, unscrupulous employers and the second with these institutions. If this is not highway robbery, that's somehow being robbery stamp by existing regulations, for the life of me, I don't know what it is, is when you make the calculations, and it's very easy to, to put all the, the whole thing into the equation, and you, at the end, you see that there is a 390% increase, or that's how much people are paying, literally speaking, throughout the year. That's something that leaves a lot to be desired. So uh, yes, this a good discussion that's taking place, and hopefully that's going to create better regulations that are going to be more transparent, more fair, and easy to understand. So to give a real chance to people who really need, instead of gouging them. So I will support the recommendations from Councilor Nunciara, and I will be holding this item for debate at City Council, because I do have other recommendations that I will put forward, because under the City of Toronto Act, the city has the option in terms of restricting the number of locations within the, the city and per war as well. So I'm just letting you know that I will be holding this item for the Beta City Council. Thank you. So we have, uh, there's one motion from Councillor Nunciara. Can we display that one? Could I ask for a recorded vote, please? A recorded vote on this one. Speaker Nunciara, uh, Councillors Palacio, and uh, Carrie Janis, the Veramaker, and Burnside. Unanimous, thank you. And on the, uh, now we have to adopt the item as amended. Yes. So, recorded as well? Yes. Recorded. Uh, Castro Nunciara Palacio, and uh, Carrie Janis, the Veramaker, and Burnside. Unanimous, thank you. So we have the next item that's before us. Is the work plan review of chapter 545 licensing by the wrap parlors and holistic centers. And we have a lengthy list of speakers here and we'll start with, I'm going to be calling in um, Batch of four, Tim Lambrinos, Elaine Lam, Barbara Goss, or Gosset, and uh, Brianna Graves. And we'll start with uh, Tim Lambrinos. Good afternoon, Mr. Lambrinos. Thank you for waiting and for being patient. And you have uh, three minutes. Uh, please uh, go ahead. I wouldn't have missed it for anything. It was quite interesting today. Uh, yesterday. Um, another day. Um, um, I wanted to uh, <clears throat> start by talking about the staff report that's uh, before uh, you. And I wanted to uh, welcome, the, he calls himself the interim uh, deputy city manager. I would like to refer him as the, the deputy manager, Mr. Lou De Geronimo and talk briefly with him and Mr. Grant earlier about the possibility of putting an interim control bylaw which pertains to 
as a better means of be able to address uh, this particular issue. It brought some more comprehensive report. It refers specifically to land use and zoning, but it would require your committee to come back with a joint meeting of the um, Planning and Transportation, uh, not sorry, Planning and Growth Management Committee and, um, and this committee as well. So it is possible to do that if in fact um, you want to get some more um, teeth in terms of an omnibus review. Um, the, the comprehensive review that the staff report talks about, um, there's a few recommendations that I have as uh, the vice chair had said before earlier, provide some recommendations to staff. So the first is that um, <clears throat> the current bylaw, the body rub bylaw, talks about the, a certificate or a form that's supplied for a health check, a medical check. But it's not required for more than once every three years. Uh, the, the wording talks about may not be, may may, may this. It should be mandatory. It should be made as a yearly submission on a health check. We've got the reason for licensing to Mr. DiGeronimo is there's three reasons why business, occupation, or trade can be licensed. One is consumer protection and the other is health and safety. So you're talking about consumer protection here. In the holistics, it's, there's no, there's no um, even mention of it. The other section um, that pertains to the, uh, the body rub parlors, um, it says that you do have the medical uh, officer of health, you do have the authority to do that. But again, under the list, is, it's non-existent. So I believe that Mr. DiGeronimo can direct the medical officer of health to come up with maybe a threshold, what would uh, constitute what be called communicable diseases, STDs, and for the interests of public safety. That's one of the suggestions that the staff could look at. Um, the second uh, is that um, currently the way that the wording is is that they're not supposed to be equipped to interfere with enforcement, but we've heard from Mr. Grant and Ms. Cook that um, this is a significant problem. In the holistic centers, it's non-existent, so it's a suggestion there to duplicate those to help the, the staff give them the tools that they need to do. Uh, another thing I spoke to Mr. Grant earlier about was um, signaling devices, uh, panic alert systems that are needed. Uh, within the individual cubicles. Uh, another idea to ensure that the, the attendants can get some. Now, the current regarding for outdoor signs, um, there are some requirements to talk about that. Specifically, the outdoor sign that should be um, for body rubs, uh, I'll just wrap up quickly, is that um, the advertisement should include the business license number on the sign. So in summary, Mr. Chair, and this is my last one, is that a signaling device or panic alert system be considered by staff to be required for individual ser uh, service cubicles for safety, that the body, body rubs be, have to give an application for a certificate, you, and Ambrino. the last two are on the board. Is um, it would be possible to share this information or your submission with the members of the committee? Yeah, I can. Um, yeah, so uh, if you don't mind. Uh, do you want this? Uh, I mean, I have summarized it in the end. The, I mean, this one. Yeah, no, then we, we look into it. So if uh, the whole thing? The clear will just uh, come and talk to you, okay? Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Questions to the deputant? Okay. Thank you for coming. Right. Elena Lam is the next speaker. Thank you, Ms. Lamb, for waiting. It's been a long day, and uh, I do understand that you've been waiting patiently for most of the day. So please go ahead. You have uh, three minutes. Okay, thank you very much. I think this is a very, very important issue. Even the staff report is uh, recommend the review of the um, body rub and holistic standard that we are welcome, but the purpose of the reviewing is very problematic because the purpose of the reviewing is to increase the law enforcement. But what are we concerned is the um, abuse of the bylaw officer so that we are from the coalition of like uh, against bylaw uh, enforcement so that we are like working with different human rights organizations and we are working with like different um, uh, legal clinic about this issue. So and I think this is very important for the committee 
to see how the bylaw officer should be accountable and stop any kind of human rights violation, misconduct when they do the uh, investigation, especially in holistic center and body rock parlor. And the second thing is just as I said, so that the review of the bylaw should and increase the safety and health and also the um, public uh, safety instead of focus on how to in increase the problematic enforcement. And the other thing is one of the proposal is they would like the committee today to uh, pass the recommendation about uh, prohibited the new um, member from five PHA to obtain the new license. So that I will go to the point. So here's some of the harassment so that happened in massage parlor, so including holistic center or body rock parlor. So that for example, the officer will ask the girl to take off the clothes to check their underwear to see whether their clothes is professional. So, and also they will check like um, their ID and a lot of racial profiling because majority of the people in holistic center are racialized, Asian. So, and the target of this uh, population is also very um, problematic. And we also find that like when there is a lot of concern about trafficking, right? But we see actually by law officers is using anti-trafficking initiative to conduct the harassment. So that is uh, breaking the relationship and trust to the law enforcement. So that not only trafficking, but when they have robbed or, or rape or they have other assaults, they are not able to seek help. And in the research, actually 33% of the worker, they have been um, harassed by or, or have experienced different kind of human rights violation from the law enforcement. And here also is the statistics. So the start report is like say there is huge increase of the bylaw violation of the of like holistic center. But this is the statistic why there is so many increase of the like prosecution is because they have increased the number for more than like 300 times since 2013 to 2016. There is only 410 holistic center, but you see the like holistic petitioner that they are being investigated more than 2,000. 500 times, and they also talk about the holistic center. They are the the PHA. They are um, have high percentage of the people which the by law. But you can see because majority the thank you, Ms. Lam. From that, so that is um, so you. that we really hope that um, we have we questions have uh, from members of and Vice Chair Kari Janis, and then Council Brown side. Thank you. I wondering your presentation said um, human rights abuses by the bylaw officers. Nowhere in here though, the coalition against abuse by bylaw enforcement. I didn't see anything in here about asking us to do stuff about human trafficking, asking us to take a look at the abuse that these women uh, or men face at the hands of the people that bring them illegally into Canada, withhold their passports. Where, where are you in this? Yeah, so the, I think this is as a human rights activist, and I think we are also working with a lot of human rights legal clinics, so we are concerned about this issue. But you see that is the um, illusion produced, like, because Butterflies and Stephen Community House and Holistic Petitioner Alliance has outreach more than 1,000 um, people in the massage parlor. Actually, why we need the bylaw? Because the bylaw well, how can... How many women that work in massage parlors through the chair so is, would be here uh, on, on human trafficking? How many? What was the percentage that your organization Yeah, so has? we have conducted research about that to us about labor exploitation so violence, and none of them have, have been like experienced. We are working closely with the like community, and I think that is Let very... Let me repeat my question yeah. through the chair, mm -hmm. and please, if you don't have a number, don't give me a number. Okay. What's the percentage of individuals that work at these holistic organizations that are under pressure and are here in Canada under human trafficking. What's the percentage? I think for human trafficking, so that massage parlor, we have conducted research and none of them is being trafficked. So in, in, in the massage none. parlor, we are reaching in Toronto. Oh, so that, me, that's just the question. Let me see if I we, understand this. None of the individuals that work in these holistic so-called uh, massage parlors and I have to tell you, I got 10% of them between Shepherd and Kennedy to Steeles and Kennedy in my ward. There's yeah. about 40 of them. Yeah. None of these women are here illegally and are forced into this particular trade. This is what you're telling me. Yes, I think that is what is the purpose of the bylaw is that people can work sorry, legally. My question yeah. is, yeah. My, sorry, I'm, I'm not trying to badger you. No, no, no. I okay. need a clear answer and it, because you're involved in the field and you've yes. done a lot of work. Yeah. None of these women 
that are working in these operations are here under conditions that one will call human trafficking. Is this what you're telling me? Uh, yes, so they may experience labor exploitation, they may experience the like rob or robbery or like the, the abuse from the uh, by law enforcement because we just finished our research recently, so that is our like funding. And I think what is the issue is because the law enforcement is so much uh, excessive and violent, so that make the people more underground, the people are not able to work in massage parlor. When I first outreach, I found the people not have document can work, but now the people are work more like underground. I think that is also so that, like the problem. Yeah. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Burnside. Would you be able to share those documents, uh, that, that survey that you did with us? You said you did a survey about women working. I think we have, have it. copies of that. Yeah, we will submit it later. So, yeah. Okay. okay. So we won't see. Councillor Karichanis, there is a communication here with all that information from Islam. Sure. And that's uh, LS 24.2.7. Okay. Councillor Karichanis, uh, I mean, uh, Burnside. Please go ahead. I know it's, it's easy to confuse us. Um, no, 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 not at all. <laughs> so, all right, let me understand this, uh, just for clarification. Are you concerned about human trafficking in the industry or not concerned? I think human trafficking is one of the issue violence facing by the sector. Okay, hold on. I'll care about human trafficking. Yeah, yeah. So you, it is a concern. It's our concern. Yeah. Okay, you are concerned about that. Yes. Okay, I notice the next speaker on the list is from the Canadian Centre to end human trafficking. Have you spoken to her or no? Okay. But I think, um, yeah. Okay, that's fine. Um, there was a, you had a slide there where you said, oh, there it is. The number of um, prosecutions has gone up. And it's your, I believe you said, um, or your contention is the number of prosecution, the violations that is, have gone up because the number of senders have gone up. Yeah. I think the is that correct? Is increase the, of the investigation and it's because of the minus infraction. So that you see that is the actual charge. What they charge is like the small scratch in the massage bed, they got a ticket. So that like the... Like that is what happened. Why the like the number of prosecution has in, in increased because the excessive abusive by law enforcement in the massage parlor. So that make a lot of people get charged. And there is the like the okay. name card. So that when they don't have the license number in the name card, they also get charged. You see the number. So that is it's not like like. Uh, so then, I guess what you're saying violation, is but it's mainly is, is they got charged of this like minor okay. uh, violation, and I think. Okay, hold on. I got asked lot, lots of questions. Yeah. You're you're uh, providing some great answers, but just, I need to cut it off a little bit. Um, so, are you saying that some of these charges or some of these rules are really not warranted, and we should probably just get away with <laughs> and really streamline the rules? That's what you're saying? Yeah, I think two issues. One is we need to know about the purpose of the law enforcement, right? So that to ensure the safety and also work and safety of people and the public and the worker. But it's not using the bylaw to abuse, like to give the ticket of the people. Now okay. the purpose of investigation. So, and I think the other reason now they trying to propose like five PHA cannot get the um, That's all, I didn't ask that question. Okay. So please, if you don't mind, okay. uh, only because I have three minutes. One of your slides, you, you um, referred to racism. Yes. Okay, what's your basis for making that assertion? Yeah, I think one of the proposals they said, like, they want to uh, not allow five PHA, so to um, give out new, uh, the member of the new, um, the member of this five PHA cannot get the license. So, but actually what happened is this five PHA, the majority of the member actually is the Asian, in particular Chinese. So in our like outreach, more than 80% of the workers are Chinese. So that a lot of so they've targeted our staff. Your contention is that our staff have targeted these organizations because they're primarily Asian. We yeah, right. we find that like That's your a contention. lot of investigation. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Is I believe that um, Councillor Wantam has some questions. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, Yes, thank you very much. And uh, just understanding the the presentation that you've uh, you've uh, just provided the committee, uh, with respect to the concerns around the abuse of uh, of bylaw enforcement and perhaps overstepping their their bounds uh, boundaries, um, with your concern about the excessive um, and and perhaps targeted um, enforcement, is that correct? Yes, yes. And, and this is based on the fact that, you've, that, the, that there's a population that, of holistic practitioners that, that are racialized um, people 
uh, predominantly women, is that correct? Yes. And also, is English their, their predominant first language? And no, so that majority is the new immigrants, so that racialized, particular Asian and Chinese, yeah. And so when bylaw enforcement officers or police police officers come in, uh, how do they communicate with these workers? I think the English is very limited, so that like they will use different way to, um, so for example, sometimes they spend one hour to check like different places and ask some question. And because of the worker, the English is limited, so that normally what happens is they will um, give the like um, ticket and also sometimes they give the order. So for example, ask the woman to take off the clothes or ask them to stand, don't allow to let them to like um, uh, go to the washroom. So and find a lot of minors issue to give them a, a ticket. So that's what's the uh, interaction experience, what the workers told us. Yeah. And under what, uh, what circumstance do you think would give a bylaw officer the right to ask a, uh, a practitioner, holistic practitioner, uh, under what, what is situation would, would that warrant that they would ask someone to take off their clothes and to show her underwear? I think so that like from the petitioner so that they said is the huge change of the way of the bylaw enforcement. So because before they are more collaborative and so that like when they come in they have better attitude. But now they come in they treat them as the criminal so that they would like to like um, they feel that they use like the purpose of the investigation is to give them different like ticket. And I think that in the report, they also said that they suspect some people is offering like body rob service and also other like uh, other kind of like illegal activity. But normally, so that the people is just regular working, and sometimes the bylaw enforcement give them the order to do so. Yeah. And so, is it your belief and the belief of the workers that their human rights are being violated? Yes, this is a serious like human rights violation. Yeah, and also make the people feel um, not respected and very inhuman treatment. And have you engaged the services of, of lawyers or legal clinics to help you build your, your case? So that we have working with the um, Chinese and Southeast Asian legal clinics, so they have been helping us to take in some cases. And also we also contact the Barbara Schleifer legal clinic, so they are also working with us about like the human rights violation issue. Yeah. So you've gone public, Time's up. You've gone Thank public you. with them. Uh, any other um, Councillor De Beer Maker. Uh, thank you. Through, through you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much for coming in today. Um, I think, would you agree that your submission to us and what's in the staff report are very, very different? Very different, because when they develop the staff report and even the audit report they refer to, so that is like based on the staff experience. So there is no formal consultation to the holistic petitioner. So there is no um, consultation um, to the PHA, so like the professional association. I think that process is very problematic. And a lot of their allegation is not evidence-based. So, so, and I think a lot of information also misleading. So for example, the statistic I show is from the information from bylaw enforcement, but they never show it in the report. So for example, like the, it's ridiculous. So for 400 massage we hear so much complaint of the noise all day, right? But you see how like 20% of the inspection is in that 400, like um, uh, with that petitioner. I think that is ridiculous. Okay. Yeah. Now, uh, when you did, did your research, do you believe there is any illegal activity happening in I those think, centers? I think any sector may have different like uh, activity, right? So that there is already the bylaw of the holistic uh, bylaw so that regulate that. If the people violate that particular bylaw for, for example, offering other service, they can be charged. Right. But now they, what they well, do my is question, they use yeah, My other question things. to you, and I'm not trying to cut you off, but we have a short time. Okay. My question to you is, based on your research, do you believe there are illegal activities happening in some of these places. But very small proportion. Very so small like, proportion. Yeah, so like for, for example, like. So then you're not, so again, so you're, you've said to us before, at one level, you believe that the biggest threat to the women is not the human traffickers. Yes. But our bylaw enforcement Yes, officers. exactly, yeah. It's also from the like uh, experience from the worker reflect to us. So, and our, our bylaw enforcement officers identified five associations or five groups that were causing, I think, or not causing, that were related to 98% of the problems. Yeah. So don't you think that you and I should enforce the law independent of race or ethnicity? We should base based on evidence and facts. Yeah, I so think. If, so if I, if I inspect your company 
and you're breaking the law, shouldn't I do something to stop you? I, and I don't care what race or ethnic background you are? I think, I think yes, but the way they break the law so that I think they don't give the complete picture to the committee and also all the councillor because like why 80% of the 90% of the people break the law because 90% of the people is belongs to that company when they are like the, like the football player right so that when majority is the football player of course the rate of the football player involved in, in like the like football injury is higher because it's related right so I think that is the information the staff have not shown it to us and what kind of violation you see why the tickets being issued compared with the chair here broken so that like tiny scratch they get a thank you time is up any other questions thank you very much appreciate thank it thank you. thank you and thank the people that also brought you here thank you barbara ghost i don't think that's for me <laughs> no uh, unfortunately that was for the the previous and then and, and certainly so. uh, uh I'm not going to say anything because I recognize some of the individuals that work up in my part of the world. Ms. Gross, you got three minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Um, my name is Barbara Goss. I'm the CEO of the Canadian Centre to End Human Trafficking. Um, the Centre has been happy to meet with policymakers at the city and politicians, including Councillor Burnside and Mayor Tory, to identify the facts surrounding the human trafficking occurring in the city licensed establishments, such as the holistic centres and body rub parlours in Toronto. In September of 2017, we met with the MLS and social development staff, along with additional stakeholders, including survivors of human trafficking, victim advocates, and Toronto Police. It was disappointing to us to see that none of the details of our meetings were identified under this report in the section identified as previous stakeholder feedback. We do know that in 2013, this issue came before City Council. And City Council publicly recognized that this crime was taking place in these establishments. However, to date, very little has been done to stop this. Survivors of human trafficking, Toronto Police, and frontline service providers have all confirmed that people are being trafficked in body rub parlors and holistic centers licensed by the City of Toronto. Toronto Police has in fact confirmed, and I quote, at one time or another, every victim of sex trafficking in the city is forced to provide sexual services in the legitimate body rub parlors or the illicit massage businesses pretending to be holistic centers. I'm here really for three reasons. One, the Auditor General's report of October 24, 2018, adopted by City Council on November 8th last year, clearly identified that there is a problem with many city-approved professional health associations. The city relies on accredited professional health associations to govern their members, the members who are licensed holistic practitioners, to ensure the integrity and honesty of their services. The city auditor general reviewed the top 10 PHAs by membership and found, and I quote from that report, a number of them appear to operate on paper only. Many have all the required documentation in their applications, but they have questionable addresses, such as residential addresses, one located in an abandoned building, another at a cottage, or a P.O. box. If the Auditor General can identify that 10 PHAs are operating basically illegally, or at least under false pretenses, why does the MLS division not recognize this also? The report before you irresponsibly proposes a moratorium only on five professional holistic associations, even when the recent Auditor General's report emphasized that there were double that number basically operating illegally. The moratorium on new licenses or renewals of existing licenses should extend to all those being submitted under the guise of illegal professional holistic associations, identified by your Auditor General. New licenses or renewals of existing licenses should only be permitted by the city when it is proven that the related professional holistic association is in good standing, operates legally in accordance with solid business and professional practices. No municipal sanctioned licenses should be granted or renewed if the business is operating under false pretenses or potentially operating illegally. Secondly, it's important to understand that the city auditor also identified... Oh. Thank you. Maybe one of the councillors will ask you to finish. Um, outside councillors? You good? Okay. Well, here's a question. Um, yes, Councillor yes. Wong-Tam. Yes, thank you. Can you please finish your thought? Thank you very much. Um, 
We would like to recommend a few things. One, that the MLS be instructed to only issue new licenses or renew licenses under applications associated with legally operating professional holistic associations who offer full and correct information on their practices, membership, addresses, and operations. We recommend that the staff at MLS be instructed to place a moratorium on all applications that request a new license or a renewal of an existing license under any professional holistic association that seems to operate only on paper or operates under false pretenses in accordance with the Auditor General's report. A more fulsome, detailed terms of reference for the study to be undertaken by MLS needs to be developed and made public at this committee and before Council. This should include the names of participants in the proposed stakeholder groups to be consulted, particularly those who work in the area of anti-human trafficking, which are not identified now in the report before you. This should also include the identifi identification of participating city staff, as well as the number, timing, and content of the proposed meetings to be held. The report is not specific in this regard. The terms of reference should also provide specifics on the areas of study or the scope of work that should not be limited, that should include but not be limited to two, two items. A full review of the licensing bylaws concerning trades and businesses that are known to be destinations for human trafficking with the objective of establishing measures and policies aimed at addressing the consequences of human trafficking from the perspectives of health, safety and crime prevention and two, to report on a strategy to more vigorously prosecute charges related to municipal bylaw infractions by the adult entertainment, body rub, and holistic license classes. There is evidence to show that there are many of these licenses who've been operating um, and providing unauthorized services. The City Auditor General found that 107 licensed holistic centres have the appearance of offering unauthorized services. We have had a professional consultant also take publicly available data and using 20 red flag indicators has found that of the 410 licensed holistic practitioners, 168 of those are providing unauthorized services over and above what the license provides currently. 12 of the 168 identified were directly advertising services of sex. 10 of the 12 were operating openly as brothels based on explicit evidence that's publicly available if you go on the internet. And I'll leave my comments there. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Burnside. Thank you. Uh, through you. So in the report, uh, the report recommends that um, five of these PHEAs be excluded, correct? Yes. It also identifies 37 actual PHAs. Yes. Do you not find it odd that there are 37 professional, professional holistic associations? Like isn't there generally like one medical association and one law society and am I missing something? No, I, I absolutely agree with you. I think it's very odd and in fact the Auditor General found at least 10 and they did a, they did a limited review but they found 10 were not operating. Right, um, so do you share my concern that if you uh, identify five and I, I think the rationale for that was that 97% of the infractions were from people that were associated with those five, that when you have um, 32 others to choose from, exactly. that you're just kind of move and you would apply and then for your it license and then moving under. it and chasing it. Absolutely. Would it not make sense? I don't even know if it's possible, but to identify the actual PHAs that are legitimate. Absolutely. Does that not seem like a simple? Yes, and it would seem to me that. The wording um, in the, the recommendation should be that only licenses be approved through any legally operating uh, PHA with proper business practices that has accreditation. And the accreditation would come from where? That I would suggest you might ask your MLS staff about that. Well, I thought I'd ask you. Would you say it would come through our, the city or who would accredit it? I don't think the city can do that. Yeah, I don't think the city accredits. Right. So how would we? Uh, what would that? 
you have any ideas? If you have well, no suggestions, well, if, that's fine, I'll if ask the, that. If the Auditor General is able to find, through a limited review, 10 that don't operate under professional accreditation, the Auditor General could probably f look at the rest of them and find out which ones are actually operating legally. Right, okay. Okay, I'll, ask, I'll follow up more with staff. Uh, anything else you want to add? No? Okay, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much for coming in today. Uh, your deputation that I've just been listening to sounds very, very different than the deputant before you. Would you agree that there are very different conclusions? I think so. And uh, um, the deputant before you, I asked her if she thought that human trafficking was a problem with those five specific um, uh, groups plus others in the industry and she said no almost none so do you have the same opinion no I don't your opinion is different yes it is um, and it's and it's informed through conversations with law enforcement different areas of the city where there are um, known high rates of human trafficking um, through either illicit massage businesses or through licensed Right. businesses by the city right. and I, I think I had asked the deputy before you if in her opinion the bigger threat to women was from human traffickers or from our licensing inspectors and she said the bigger threat to women was from our licensing inspectors what's your opinion who's the bigger threat to women the traffickers or the inspectors in the city of Toronto or are they equal what are your thoughts my opinion is that human traffickers are a huge threat to women and girls, minors. Last year, the City of Toronto Police had 60 victims of human trafficking in this city. The majority of those were under the age of 18. Over half of those under the age of 18 were under the age of 16. And they have stated that at one time or another in the life of every trafficked person, they are trafficked through holistic services or body rub parlors in the city. And the... Uh the recommendations that you just gave to us in, in your deputation, yes. do you have those in writing? Have they been circulated? I do. I, I have not, but I will. I can provide them to, is it Julie? To the clerk? To yep. Okay, yes. Okay, and, and what are your suggestions again? So one, you're saying... I think, um, I think there needs to be a more fulsome review done. This is a complicated issue. There are a lot of stakeholders that need to be brought to the table, including those who are active in the anti-human trafficking area. The city's report doesn't um, really specify uh, that under stakeholders, which they really need to do. Um, but also there needs to be a moratorium on licenses. Um, new licenses are the renewal of licenses. Um, under applications that are uh, affiliated with um, any prof professional holistic association that seems to, as the Auditor General said, operate only on paper. Okay, great. Uh, I'm going to jump in because I've got four seconds left. So if you could somehow get a, a written version of that to our clerk, it's yeah. very difficult it right for now. me or email. It's very difficult for me and other committee members to... I'm Take I apologize your advice for that. when we have absolutely nothing in front of us. You're absolutely right. Okay. I'll do that right now. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Is uh, Vice Chair Karijanis, you have a question? Thank, thank you, Chair. Thank you for coming today. Really appreciate your, your being here. We heard from the previous speaker that they had hardly any or they were, they couldn't find any. Um, people that are working in these um, uh, body rubs that were um, here under human trafficking conditions. Do you agree with that? They, they themselves may be truthful in that statement, but I know from conversation that they themselves may not have spoken to people who are human trafficked, but we know from speaking to law enforcement that this is an escalating crime. It is um, a crime that is underground, there is no question. It's very difficult to find. Obviously, those who are trafficking individuals, including minors, will not want this to be seen. Um, but I know from heads of certain police divisions that they are very challenged with trafficking that is happening in various parts of the city, all over the parts of the city. 
Would you, I mean, I've been told by police officers that a lot of the, the individuals that work in these establishments are coming over here, uh, they're paying twelve to $15,000, and then their passports are withheld, and then they're forced to, to work in, in this industry in order to pay off their passage. Would I be incorrect in, in, in saying that? There, there are incidents like that, and I've heard about that as well from law enforcement. In fact, I've met survivors of human trafficking who will, who will speak to that as well and those experiences. However, we know that the majority of traffic victims are actually born in Canada. We know that the majority of victims are not being brought in from other countries, although we do know that there are certain segments of holistic services and, and body rub parlors where there are particular um, numbers of women that come from other countries and they are clustered together in these instances as well. And law enforcement will corroborate that. All right, thank you very much, appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you, anyone else? Thank you, Ms. Uh, Goes, for your presentation. We'll move on to the next four. Brianna Gra uh, Greaves, Cara uh, Giles, Sandra Kak, and Kahon Chu, and Andrea Sterling. That I'd like to, to ask uh, to ask the um, deputants is that uh, what I personally have been listening and I think my colleagues are thinking the same is throughout the deputations, there is uh, most of the comments are repetitive. So if uh, there is something new that you can add on to it, that would be very helpful for all of us to, to understand actually exactly what needs to be done as we move on. But to repeat exactly the same, it's not going to help. So I'm asking you, please, let's uh, try to focus on the report. Thank you. Please go ahead. You have uh, three minutes. Mr. Chairman, may maybe we can ask that some of them, if they can group their deputation. It would, because, because the interest of time, because we might lose quorum, that if they can group it, it would make it a lot easier. Yeah, that will also, thank you. Yeah, because Asun we might break quorum and you won't, we won't be able to make a decision today. So if, um, now, I hope that you have this list that we all have. If there is a way to, uh, to make deputations as a group, maybe two or three or whatever, and that would be much easier. And it's much easier to organize and to, uh, to move forward. Great. Yeah, especially if you are with the same organization. So you can have only one speaker speaking on behalf of the group as opposed to do it individually. Is that okay? Great. Okay, please go ahead. I'm sorry for the disruption. Please go ahead, three minutes. Thank you. Um, my name is Brianna Graves, and I'm speaking today on behalf of Showing Up for Racial Justice Toronto, uh, called Surge, a local chapter of an international organization committed to undermining white support for colonial and white supremacist systems and institutions. As members of Surge, we are deeply concerned about the various ways in which City of Toronto bylaw enforcement continues to violate the human rights of licensed holistic practitioners, a group made up almost entirely of Asian and migrant workers, most of whom speak English as a second language. This is a clear issue of racial discrimination and racial profiling by the City of Toronto happening to some of the most vulnerable workers in our community, and we can't stand by while that's happening. City of Toronto Municipal Licensing and Standards is proposing that no applications for new holistic practitioner licenses be accepted from members associated with five professional holistic associations. And we strongly oppose this proposal by MLS. The proposal to place a moratorium on new members is informed by the 2017 Auditor General's report on the governing of holistic centers and practitioners, which was conducted by the staff of the MLS without consultation with holistic practitioners. PHAs or other stakeholders with lived experience. This report is deeply flawed and we understand its recommendations to be based on discriminatory bylaw enforcement practices supported by an extensive history of targeted inspections, excessive fining, human rights 
programs and racist surveillance that targets Asian newcomer holistic practitioners. The 2017 Auditor General's report illustrates the city's discriminatory position on holistic centers and the work of holistic practitioners evidenced by inaccurate allegations related to public health, community safety, incidents of human trafficking and the provision of unauthorized services. It reveals that stereotypes are being employed to accuse all practitioners of offering sexual services and to create an inaccurate impression of the risk of human trafficking. In reality, more than 95% of practitioners are over the age of 30, with no minors working as practitioners, with no evidence that practitioners are trafficked or coerced into the profession. Given this misinformation, we are gravely concerned about the real-world negative impacts these recommendations will have on the lives of holistic practitioners, as well as the impacts on their families and communities that are supported by their labor. In light of this, we urge you to withdraw the proposal calling for a moratorium on new members and to conduct a comprehensive consultation with holistic centers and practitioners as soon as possible to formulate suggestions for amending relevant bylaws and, and regulations. And as evidenced by our last speaker, speaking primarily and listening primarily to law enforcement will give you an incomplete picture of the situation. And it's really clear that the people who are most affected, that we are all, that you are concerned about protecting, you are not listening to, and that has to change. That is why you have the wrong picture of what's going on. Um, and. Uh, Basically, to date, the City of Toronto's approach to licensing of holistic practitioners and body rub workers is characterized by um, lack of consultation, and we Thank urge you to take action Thank to you. change your approach. Thank you. Thanks. Questions? We have a few, and uh, Councillor Burnside. So, does it, uh, from what you said, um, I inferred that you, um, your concern is that the that law enforcement really doesn't know what's going on? Um, I think that uh, that's one way of, of characterizing. I'm just, I'm just very to the point. Yeah, I think okay. I think that they there isn't a like listening to the people who are most involved and most affected. So when we're talking about stakeholders, I, it seems to me that even including this the Auditor General's report, not consulting with the people who are the most affected by these decisions. There, there's a long history. Well, I think of this, the Auditor General's report racism. was was really. Um, more about is this a legitimate association or is it not? I don't think one needs to consult, my opinion anyway. What's a, what's, what is a holistic practitioner? Number eight. That it would be a, a very good question to ask the people who are um, well, holistic practitioners aligned. You're kind of here speaking on their behalf, so I would assume. This you is know an what example of what I'm talking about is like you are talking to other people about folks who your decisions are really deeply impacting. The reason I'm here is to implore you to change the approach that you're taking to making decisions. You just have to include the most marginalized people, especially people with language barriers, racialized people. There's just a long okay, pattern so of this in the city. Uh, unfortunately, I have three minutes. And, but my question to you is, what is a holistic practitioner? If you don't know, I'm trying to understand. That's why I'm asking questions. If you don't know, I don't, I'm just trying to, if that's, if that's your answer, then that's fine. Um, do you, do, uh, there are 37 uh, PHAs, Professional Holistic Associations, right? Don't you find that to be kind of a lot? Don't. Yeah, you, would that you would not? Be a good question to ask. Why? Why is it that way? Um, okay, why is it that way? Ask the people involved in them. Why? Why is it that way? That that they would probably have an answer for why that is the case. You don't have any answers. I don't have the answer to that. Okay, question. thanks. Yeah. Councillor Kritschanis, next. Thank you, Chair. Um, there is 400 or so um, holistic centers operating, uh, legally or illegally, and I can't speak for others, but in my ward, I have 40, mm -hmm. from on Long Kennedy, from Shepherd and Kennedy up to Steeles and Kennedy. And I went on some of their websites, and they have explicit, explicit pictures with personal phone numbers and offering other services. And I've looked at a lot of them, and I find them very, uh, very concerning. Would something like that be concerning to you? Um, how, can you tell me more about what your concern is? Explicit pictures of women in undergarments, uh, in, in, in very delicate positions, I mean, uh, positions that are um, inviting. I mean, wouldn't, that you, wouldn't you find that troubling? I, no, I don't. 
I don't. You have don't. So if I was to go to a holistic um, place to get a massage, that'd be okay with you if they're advertising extra services. I don't. I don't think that. Um, that I have the expertise to answer that question. Sorry, you don't think what? I don't have the expertise to answer that particular question. No, but you said that you, don't, you didn't find any of them offering these kinds of services. I think that people, um, and some of the people, like a subsection of people that we're talking about are um, creating a, a economically viable life for themselves and if you, uh, and supporting communities and if you uh, wanna find out more about, you know, supporting we're talking about communities? protections, you're talking about, um, issues of uh, exploitation, if that's what we're concerned about. Yeah, well, don't you find that, that I mean, it, it, having, people, I mean, when you're advertising, them them. when you're advertising a body rub place and you've got explicit pictures showing women in undergarments and revealing undergarments and you are attracting a certain amount of customers. Every industry, every, like, let's be honest, that's most industries have uh, used that to sell, to get customers. Like sex sells, right? So. You could argue that that's happening. So, by other words, if sex sells, they would be selling sex in those establishments. That's that's not what I'm saying. Well, what are you saying then? Uh, I'm saying that my main point of coming up here and talking to you is to say and to ask you to please start listening to the people that you're talking about and that you're legislating about, and that are if you talk to them, they tell you that they're the violence they're experiencing is more from enforcement than from, than from trafficking. If you actually talk to them and listen to them, they are not being heard. Language barriers are a part of it, but they just are not. The There's fact no that, that, you know, my, you my, haven't, my, Elaine Lamb wasn't considered, like wasn't My, my time is up, but let me reassure you. There's no language barrier in my office in interacting with these folks and interacting with the people that work there and the information that we get from them. Thank and you, I, Councilor. I thank Richards. you for coming, but I disagree with your statements. Any other questions? Thank you for your deputation. Thank you. Cara Giles. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, and thank you so much for the opportunity to address you today. My name is Cara Gillis, and I'm with the Canadian Alliance for Sex Work Law Reform. We are a coalition of about 30 organizations who have come together to advance law reform that supports the rights and safety of people who sell or trade sex in Canada. One of our areas of interest is the ways in which laws impact the exploitation of people in the sex trade or in other erotic or adult industries. As such, we appreciate the committee's and city council's concern about exploitation in relation to body rub parlors, and we are pleased at the opportunity to share our expertise in this area. Something we regularly encounter is the common assumption that restrictive regulatory frameworks, including stringent licensing conditions and heavy enforcement, are effective at combating exploitation, including human trafficking. I need to stress that this is not true. Excessively strict conditions on where, when, and how people can go about their work actually pushes people away from licensed regimes. Either workers can't meet the narrow licensing criteria or workers avoid regulatory regimes because they actually undermine their safety and their rights and expose them to exploitation. And today I wanted to provide a couple of examples of provisions within the current body rub parlors bylaw that perhaps inadvertently facilitate this type of abuse. The first is section 338A, which prohibits body rubbers from being employed by more than one owner or at more than one parlor at a time. This provision severely limits workers' employment options, which in turn diminishes their power to negotiate the terms of their work and the quality of their work conditions. This, of course, leads to substandard or even exploitative work conditions, such as arbitrary fines, unreasonable shifts, and poor pay. Demanding this level of worker dependence on one employer creates conditions not just for labor exploitation, but for human rights violations, including discriminatory employment practices based on workers' race, age, and other protected grounds. This level of reliance on a single employer also increases the potential risk of human trafficking as people's options and agency are constrained and they are thus primed to comply with increasingly unreasonable demands. The second example is section 338B which requires operators to retain body rubbers licenses in their possession. I have to say this is shocking to me. 
Demanding that workers relinquish their licenses, their proof that they're eligible to work, weakens their autonomy. Requiring, requiring operators to hold this vital documentation renders workers vulnerable to unreasonable employer control and potential exploitation. And for those of you who are familiar with the dynamics of human trafficking, holding people's documentation can be a key element of coercive behavior. It's unfathomable that a city bylaw should not just permit this type of action, but outright require it. Heavy bylaw enforcement is another approach commonly misunderstood to be an effective counter-exploitation measure. The primary problem is the manner in which bylaw compliance is enforced. Body rub workers in Toronto have described enforcement officers' behaviour as demeaning and dehumanising, and you've heard a lot of that today. This style of enforcement sows distrust and fear among workers who then avoid reporting abuses and isolate themselves from city services and law enforcement protection. So we do have several recommendations for reform of body rub parlor bylaws, and you have them in the joint written submission uh, before you today. Thank you. Any questions to Councillor Bernstein? Thank you, um, through you. So my own, my real concern is just in regards to human trafficking. So we can cut right to that. Okay. Sure. The other issues, um, I, I understand, and I'm, I'm not going to argue, um, but. You mentioned that uh, a concern about the increase, uh, what would lead to an increase in human traffic and I th trafficking. And I thought you um, used the example of uh, workers only being able to be employed at one location. Perhaps not an increase, but a potential risk. When you limit people's options, you limit the control that their employers or other people have over them. Right, but if you're if you're being trafficked and you're in that world against your will, why would more choice of where you can work against your will be the beneficial? Like, I, don't, I don't understand that. The more people have for exits or for alternatives, the more opportunities they have to take those. And the more likely somebody is to be confined, physically or conceptually, to one place, the less connections they have with networks and with others. Okay, but if you're being trafficked, you actually, your, your exit is out of the whole industry. It's not going to another, no? Oh, I would totally disagree. Oh, okay. There are so maybe that's where I'm misunderstanding. There are who work in the sex trade who have had experience of exploitation or even trafficking who continue to work in non-oppressive circumstances. So I, I want to clarify oh, okay. that sex work or working for somebody else in the sex industry is in no way the same thing as being trafficked. Traffic is, trafficking is a serious human rights violation. That's what sex I'm talking about. Sex work is a way of supporting ourselves right. and our families. No, and I have no problem uh, yeah. personally uh, with, with the latter. It's the former. Yeah. So the trafficking part. Yes. So how does more choice help? when you don't want to be in the... So, when, presumably, I, I if you're... I think maybe I can clarify. Yeah, I'm sorry. My I'm point was that restricting people's options creates opportunity for exploitation, including trafficking. Not that this is going to be some sort of silver, silver bullet for people who are trafficked having um, some way out. It's more about I'm an exploitation than a yeah, trafficking. The bylaw creates conditions of vulnerability and limit people's rights and agency. And if this committee and city council are, as I believe you are, generally concerned about particularly women's well-being, you need to take into okay. account how this bylaw actually works contrary to your desires. Okay, and then I'll read your, your uh, submission. But Thank in you. terms of ending or addressing addressing human trafficking what are the suggestions in your submission or are they outside of that or do you even have any i'm not talking about the exploitation i get that part the focus of our submission was on the upcoming review of the body rub parlor bylaw and we do have suggestions as to what can be considered um, to support the rights and the safety of people in those businesses. And of course, alongside that, there would be the element of um, reducing or avoiding uh, instances of trafficking. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you for your presentation. We'll move on to, to Sandra Honchu. Yes. Thank you. I am Sandra Kahanchu, Director of Research and Advocacy at the Canadian HIV AIDS Legal Network. We're a human rights organization based in Canada, and we work to promote the rights of people living with, affected by, and at risk of HIV or AIDS. I'm going to focus my submission on two sections of body rub licensing that concern public health. 
While public health and safety are valid objectives of municipal licensing, such licensing should be based on the best public health evidence and respect human rights. In our view, these sections fail on both regards. First, subsection 333 and 346C of the bylaws require a medical exam and certification of people applying for a body rub license, who are, as you've heard, predominantly women, indicating that they're free from communicable disease. This requirement is, requirement is impractical, overly broad, arbitrary, and contrary to effective, evidence-based public health practice. As a frame of reference, Toronto Public Health lists over 60 reportable communicable diseases, ranging from HIV to food poisoning. Given the scope and number of diseases, requiring a medical practitioner to certify a patient in this regard is impracticable. The scope and number also suggest that the testing requirement is arbitrary and driven more by assumptions and moral judgments than by public health considerations. Even, even in healthcare-related jobs involving certain exposure-prone procedures, such as invasive surgery, there's no sweeping employment prohibition on persons who have a communicable disease. Given the assumed sexual nature of body rub services, it is possible that communicable diseases are presumed to be those that are sexually transmitted. Yet evidence suggests that mandatory testing of SDIs actually compromises access, access to sexual health services and drives people away from testing. Mandatory testing is also co coercive, an unethical medical practice, violates the human right to voluntary confidential testing, perpetuates stigma against people who provide sexual services, and fosters distrust of healthcare systems. Prohibiting people with STIs from employment also violates a right to be free from workplace discrimination, since body rub services can be provided by a person with an STI, including HIV, with no risk to clients. As the Ontario Human Rights Commission has noted, employment-related medical exams or inquiries conducted as part of the applicant screening process are prohibited under the Ontario Human Rights Code. Second, subsection 346 of the bylaws prohibits admission of or performance of body rub services on any person exposed to or living with any communicable disease. This means a person merely exposed to food poisoning or the flu is barred from even entering a body rub parlor. Again, this requirement is overly broad, arbitrary, and misaligned with effective public health practice. A client living with HIV, for example, poses effectively no risk of HIV transmission as a recipient of body rub services. A wholesale prohibition constitutes a violation of Ontario's Human Rights Code. Therefore, we recommend that the committee repeal both bylaws and instead commit to provide free access to sexual health resources to body rub providers and, most importantly, meaningfully consult with body rub providers in relation to further public health initiatives to ensure the health and human rights of body rub providers and clients are respected, protected, and fulfilled. And finally, I just want to adopt the recommendations put forth by my colleagues from the Canadian Alliance for Sex Work Law Reform, of which the Legal Network is a member. Thank you. Thank you. you. Questions? Thank you for your presentation. The next said. Uh, Deputants, we have Andrea Sterling and Linda Tsang, and both of them are from the Toronto Sex Workers Action Project. I'm not sure if you're willing to make a joint presentation. Is uh, I think that's um, you're Andrea Sterling, right? Yes, and uh, do we have uh, Linda Tsang here? Linda is not here. Okay, great. So please go ahead, three minutes. Hi, my name is Andrea Sterling. I'm the representative for Maggie's Toronto Sex Workers Action Project on issues related to law and regulation. I initially conduct research on the sex industry as a PhD candidate at the University of Toronto's Centre for Criminology. Maggie's mission is to provide advocacy and support to assist sex workers to live and work with safety and in dignity. As such, I will focus on two pro prohibitions in the body rub bylaws that are of great concern to us as they create unsafe working conditions. Firstly, subsections 343 and 355D prohibit locking doors and body rub parlours. In the event of a disruptive or threatening incident, workers and operators are not able to implement protective measures which place operators in potential violation of Ontario's Occupational Health and Safety Act. They also violate workers' privacy and dignity by permitting enforcement officers to walk in on women who are partially or fully undressed in changing areas and showers. 
we encourage the committee to look to the amendment made to the Holistic Centers and Holistic Practitioners Bylaw in 2005, which allowed locking doors in holistic centers for, um, for security and safety purposes. This very same logic and protection should be extended to body rub parlors. Secondly, subsection 358 prohibits the usage of photographic recording devices, including security cameras in body rub parlors. As a result, attendants are made vulnerable to a wealth of potential harms and are unable to identify disruptive or violent people to deny them future entry to the premises. Security cameras could also be a very valuable tool for law enforcement, particularly those who are interested in investigating issues relating to trafficking. We encourage the committee to review bylaws in other jurisdictions, such as Edmonton, where body rub parlors are permitted to use security cameras. Um, in Edmonton, body rubbers have reported that since they have been allowed to use security cameras, their working conditions have uh, become much more safe. Uh, to address privacy concerns, we suggest that the committee look to the changes made to the Adult Entertainment Club bylaw in 2013 following MLS's staff recommendation to amend the prohibition on cameras. The amendment allowed clubs to install security cameras and included conditions to protect privacy. Maggie's recommends that the Municipal and Licensing Standards Committee remove the prohibitions on locked doors and cameras and allow the installation of security cameras in public areas to provide safe working conditions. We also further support the recommendations uh, put forward by our colleagues um, at the uh, HIV AIDS Legal Network. Um, as we are a member of a group of the Canadian Alliance for Sex Work Law Reform. Thank you. Thank you. Right on time. Thanks so much. Questions, yes. Deputy, Deputy Mayor, you better make it. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much for coming in today. Mm -hmm. um, have you submitted your de uh, deputation and recommendations in writing to the clerk as well? I uh, was part of the joint statement that was submitted. Uh, sorry, with there's a joint statement that was submitted by my colleagues at the Canadian. Uh, okay, that must be coming around then, but it's submitted. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. The next deputant is Noel Gary. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. My name's Noel Gary. I'm a lawyer. Uh, I represent, it's actually now 22 of the 25 licensed body rub parlors. I've submitted a letter that's for your review. I think it's premature to start discussing what changes or amendments to the bylaw should be made. Okay. At this Thank particular you. meeting, I'm waiting to see what staff recommends uh, at this point, I wanted to introduce myself oh, okay. and yeah, I'll go back. Uh, ask to be included, of course, in any um, you know, consultations or meetings and, pro and provided with all materials. But other than that, uh, no comment or no instructions to deal with the recommendation with respect to the prof professional holistic associations. Uh, today, uh, just wanted to make sure you, do you have my letter? Does everybody have that letter that was submitted? It was submitted by hand on Friday to the clerk. Great. Okay, so I just want to make sure everyone had the letter and, and to make sure that my clients, who are major stakeholders, I act for 88% of the license holders of the owners of body row parlors, are included in any future consultations or meetings. Okay? It's, I have no other submission. Thank you. Any questions? Sure. If you didn't get it, I'm happy to email it to you tomorrow. No, it's, uh, I delivered it by We hand. do have a package of submissions yeah. from, uh, from yeah, everyone, yeah. so we have to go through it's it. It's in there. Okay. So it's in here. I am, yes. I've been advised by the clerk that's been here. Your submission is here. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So I, I'd ask you to kindly review it, and I'm uh, so, you know, happy to answer any questions whenever anybody wishes to call. Any questions? Thank you. I believe that I escape in uh, number nine, Justin Kong. My apologies, uh, sir. Please uh, go ahead, three minutes. 
Hello, Council. Uh, my name is Justin Kong, and I am a representative from the Chinese Canadian National Council Toronto. Uh, CCNC Toronto is an organization that has been serving Chinese Canadians in the city of Toronto for over 35 years. Uh, we've been promoting equity, social justice, diversity, and public engagement and civic engagement amongst Chinese Canadians in the city of Toronto. Uh, our community organizing work has ranged from successfully pushing the government of Canada to provide a comprehensive redress of he to head tax survivors to supporting everyday Chinese Canadians uh, in the community, whether they are new immigrants or long-time Canadian citizens. We count within our membership thousands of Chinese Canadian residents in Toronto, voters, small business owners, workers, union members, professionals, newcomers, and members from all block of life. It seems like today's discussion, I won't re reiterate uh, many of the points. I just want to make one thing really clear. Uh, we really have two interpretations, right? One is a person who has talked to a thousand of these people who work in uh, body rub and holistic practitioners. And we have another perspective, which has talked to predominantly police and, police and law enforcement. As someone who works within the community, I can tell you that there, these are two very different pictures. And there's one picture here that is more realistic and accurate and speaks to the lived experiences of people who work in these industries. And that's the view of the people who have talked to a thousand people. Uh, so to make that point more clear, holistic, holistic practitioners are not being trafficked. Of the 1,000 people that have been communicated with, none of them have been trafficked. Second point, the issue here really is an issue of racial profiling. Because what we have is a selective targeting of five uh, practitioner health associations who are predominantly racialized Chinese and Asian. They're being targeted by this policy, which you are attempting to stop them from continuing their licensing. As a representative from the CCNC Toronto, I can tell you that we find such a position reprehensible. We know many, many different racialized communities have been targeted by different policies which have negatively affected them. In the Chinese Canadian community, this is another example of a long history of targeted abuse. There is no evidence to suggest that the people who are working as holistic practitioners are being trafficked. In that case, why, can someone explain to me why is there such a disproportionate policing of these individuals? As uh, has already been made clear and it will be made more clear later on, uh, the way in which different holistic practitioners are policed is drastically different. Um, you will hear later from a, a gentleman who owns a, a store and he will tell you about the ways in which they're uh, quite practically different. So let me recap, this is an issue of profiling. If you pass this forward, what are you are saying to us is you think it is okay for enforcement to racially profile and target thank, certain th ethnic Thank you, Mr. Kang. Yeah, it's questions and uh, Councillor Burnside first. Excuse me. Excuse me, ma'am. Uh, thank you. Through you, you mentioned um, a thou the number 1,000. Was that holistic practitioners? Yeah, I believe so. Okay. So, you, um, have you spoken to all of them? No, I, I'm citing a report that was conducted uh, by another organization who has spoken. With these okay. People, right? So, so it's the, your contention that none of the, the 1,000 uh, holistic practitioners are being trafficked is based on someone else's report? Yeah, that is okay, the report that they're putting forward. Yeah, want clarification. That's all. Um, but you have a fairly good knowledge of the industry. Uh, I have a fairly good knowledge of the Chinese Canadian community. No, the holistic uh, uh, practitioner. I would say I have a fair understanding. Okay, what is a holistic practitioner? Uh, I think a holistic practitioner uh, conveys a broad range of duties and tasks. I can't say I'm an expert in that, so I can't. I, I will not be giving you a defined category of what holistic practitioners do or do not do. Okay, it's just very hard for us to make decisions when we don't even really know what we're talking about. Um, but let me ask Perhaps, you this. Yeah. So the, the body rub parlors, would, this, would a holistic practitioner be similar to someone who works in a body rub parlor, in your opinion? 
Uh, my understanding is that those are different licenses. Oh, yeah, I know. I know they're different licenses. Yeah, they're different. One licenses. pays thirteen thousand, and one pays about three hundred or something. Um, so I don't care about the license. I just want to know what if if the if they're doing the same line of work. Uh, I would assume they're in different lines of work. Yeah. So then, would it make sense to um, for the holistic? Because my concern is there are thirty-seven different PHAs or whatever yeah, they yeah. call them. Yeah, I, I think would my make, point really make, is there. No, but it's my point that I'm trying to uh, clarify here. Um, sorry to interrupt. Um, it, would it not make sense to license all these PHAs as body rub parlors and have and because it seems like forget forget any other discussion. It just seems like there's certainly an unlevel playing field here. Yeah, I'd say uh, what this proposal is, is to target five specific PHAs, which are predominantly Asian, predominantly Chinese and racialized, and to stop them from uh, accepting new members. So, but if we, but if, and I, this came up at council, if we said, hey, um, let's make, every, let's license everyone, this is just one suggestion, as a body rub parlor, that I think would take away the racialization aspect, because I, I don't think, like I think it's just here's the license for a body rub. Pay your thirteen thousand dollars, and let's figure out how we uh, how we go from there. Because it, it seems to me that the PHA is right now at paying three or four hundred bucks a year, or whatever that number is. It's actually um, working in the reverse. Yeah, I mean, and having heard the stories of the people, it's clear there is a very a racialized pattern of policing, right? It's like, uh, sorry, well, you know, like this is Chinatown. We're going to police Chinatown sorry. because, uh, yeah. Last question. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, Councillor uh, Chen. Oh, I'm sorry. Is, uh, uh, yeah, is, uh, we'll go to our visiting member, Council Council Wan Tan. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. I just want to understand your concerns are not so much the about the license, but rather the tr the treatment uh, of the of the bylaw officers when they do come into to to check for bylaw infractions. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I believe that is a very important part of it. Right, the policing and the enforcement of uh, holistic practitioners, as we've heard stories from them firsthand, has been uh, routinely abused by enforcement officers, right? The earlier story around, you know, uh, the enforcement officer uh, asking the practitioner to take off their clothes, digging through their personal belongings uh, in search of supposed suspect items uh, to people who largely don't speak English and um, are newcomers to the country. But it's not that you object licensing, you want the licensing criteria to be transparent, easy to understand. Uh, you, you're, you're in support of the licensing regime, is that correct? Uh, I think our position is that uh, the current uh, position on the table, which is to stop memberships uh, from the five PHAs, that should be stopped, right? I think we should uh, send that back to be reworked, right? Because as of right now, it is clearly targeting uh, five associations which are predominantly racialized and predominantly Chinese and Asian, right? And have clearly been over policed. And do you have any um, evidence that these five agencies are being targeted uh, as opposed to perhaps their application being incomplete? Sure. Um, so we've heard uh, from, from what we've heard from the workers, right, is that there has been a tremendous increase in the rate of uh, enforcement and the rate of uh, actually the enforcement officials coming to the stores. You'll hear more from uh, with the workers later um, who will share with you the experiences of what that has been like and the, and, and the increase in that amount, right? So to me, it seems like there is a, there is a patterned behavior here and it, it, it seems to be racialized and, and patterned in that sense, right? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, we have uh, Councilor Janis, please. Sir, we heard previously that there's a language barrier that the individuals that work in these uh, locations and then be targeted and they, they cannot speak. Is this something that you also uh, are able to confirm for us? Yeah, I would imagine um, with new, like, yeah, there are many people who may not be speaking English as their first language. Okay, if they don't speak English, then how did they get status in Canada? How did they legally were able to enter Canada? In order to come to Canada, you need to speak English. I, I believe we, we have a policy in the city of Toronto that we don't, we don't ask questions around immigration. Well, sir, I'm not asking that question, but if they don't speak English, that uh, what I'm trying to drive at, don't really worry about that, that policy. What I'm trying to drive at are that these people are coming over to Canada on a visitor visa, and they're being exploited. R regardless of how they are coming over, these people work here. They have rights here. I understand, sir, 
But what, what I'm trying what this to does is it takes, to you, makes them more vulnerable. Right? What I'm trying to point out to you, sir, is that these people are being exploited and they're human being human. They're being trafficked. They, they, as they, as they, has, they has been made clear, there is absolutely no evidence that they're being trafficked. Right? You have someone who has talked to a thousand of these people, and they told you they're not being trafficked. On the other side, you have someone who has been talking to police officers, and they're saying, "Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of trafficking going on. It's a serious problem." So clearly, well, I'll tell you that it's I've very got obvious to, to me who. What is the correct answer? Well, in, in talking to police officers in my ward, and certainly these are uh, individuals that are of, of different ethnic backgrounds, the police officers, they, they relate to me that, that there's a lot of people that have been, they're being trafficked into Canada. I mean, who do I believe? Do I believe the thousand or do I believe the police officers that are there to protect us? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think I would believe the people who are affected by the issues, who are the people working there, people who own those businesses. And I, I understand your ward very well. Many of our members are there, right? I got um, 40 of them. Sorry? I got 40 out of the 400. Right, right. and I think they're important industries, right? Massage, and, like, and a lot of them are have, important I, industries. I can start naming them. And, and, and I believe there is a clear pattern here of assuming that just because it is a Chinese holistic practitioner, they are somehow engaged in human trafficking. I think that is a highly problematic position. Would you like to I guess out of the 40 that I have, how many of them offer other services? Would you like to guess or would you like to tell me? I won't speculate on what they're doing, but I'm saying they're valued members of the Would you community. like to look at their websites? Are you saying, those, you are at their websites, are you saying those are all traffickers? Have you looked at their websites? No, I haven't looked at okay, their websites. Okay, I suggest you might want to do. Thank you, Chair. Appreciate it. Thank you, Councillor. Is uh, Deputy Mayor De Beramica, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, through you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you very much for coming in today. Um, I just want to ask you, um, I, I've read the Auditor General's report. And your submission to us is you believe that it's uh, targeting a racialized group. I, I believe the complete opposite. So I'm going to see if maybe Sorry. one or two of us can come together with the same understanding. When the Auditor General does what an Auditor General does, she, mm. her, her, the, the aim of that report was not to go out and to talk to sex trade workers. That was not, that's not what her mandate was. That's not what she was supposed to do. Mm -hmm. So if she went out and talked to a thousand sex trade workers, I would actually have been very surprised because she wouldn't have been doing her job. Her job was a very simple one, just like an accountant at income tax time. All she did was look up an organization called the Nas National Cert Certification Board for Natural Therapies. When she looked at that name, would you agree with me? You can't tell what ethnic background that organization is just by reading the title. Sure. The word Chinese is not in there. Sure. The word racialized is not in there. The word equity seeking is not in there. Uh, it's It's got... It sounds National Certification Board for Natural Therapy. So would you agree with me that if an auditor does what an auditor is supposed to do and says, I want to make sure that this organization is obeying the law and she investigates it and finds out they're not obeying the law, would sh don't you think there should be consequences to yeah. that? Yeah. Regardless of what ethnic background they were. Sure. Maybe they're Belgian. Sure. If, if, it's, if the owners of this association are Belgian, you, they should have consequences. Yeah, absolutely. So, and not, so and you'd agree they're not being targeted because they're Belgian. What, what I'm saying is the targeting is the five uh, holistic practitioner associations that, be, that are being singled out uh, to prevent them from acquiring more, new memberships. But that is what being, I'm pointing but out. They're not, would you agree with me that they're not being singled out by race? Well, no, I, I would say they are exactly they're being, being singled, singled out by violation. Right. And, and by the, not obeying the law. Absolutely. So if all of those were Belgian, all five of these sure. were Belgian based, which is my heritage. Sure. So if they were all Belgian Canadians, if you sure. will, then you'd have a list here saying these five groups that are Belgian Canadian yeah. should be not allowed to continue. And you think that would be fair? Yeah. So, I mean, on that point, the PHAs that are being targeted have the most violations, but they also have the most membership, right? And they have been. What I'm suggesting is that the very policing of those PHAs has been racialized from the beginning, right? So it's like if you're going to specific locations that are racialized, assuming that people there are being trafficked, then what you're going to come out with is violations, right? Okay. And you will see later the, the just the egregious ways in which violations are being handed out, okay. or like, you know, rips in sofas, et cetera, right? My last quick question to you. So you would feel more comfortable if during our inspe inspections, for example, and there's 400 uh, locations, that we have some random aspect to it. 
Yeah, I, 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 it's I, random. I can't pick on Belgians and I can't pick on Chinese. It's random. What, what I believe is there is a racialized enforcement that is going on, right? Thank you. Of, of policing and, oh, MLS, right? Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. So we'll go to the next one is Jading Singh, uh, Jading Singh Yunpeng, followed by Jasmine Abuz Gaya and Sean Yuen. Jaden, great. Good afternoon. Yeah. Thank you for waiting. Please uh, go ahead, two minutes. Uh, hi, my name is Jaden Pan. Also, I'm here to represent the Holistic Practitioner Alliance. So our alliance is formed by the Holistic Practitioner and, and members who are concerned about the rights and working conditions of holistic like, uh, uh, centers in Toronto. So majority of our members are newcomer uh, Canadians from Asia who have face employment challenges due to language barriers, lack of Canadian work experience, barriers to access in the Canadian job market. So um, most of them work so hard to make ends meet. Not only do holistic practitioners engage in the profession to earn money to, for themselves and families, and, and, and also recognize their own uh, professional knowledge and skills also provide a man mandatory relief and enhance emotional and physical well-being of clients. So uh, they also paying tax, that's the, the word that we heard from them. So they also pay tax, they also create a job, and they generate a city revenue via licensing fees and menu, municipal taxes. So they will think that the municipal laws or policy will be the one to protect them. But like now, since 2012, uh, and some, uh, the policy changed. So they start uh, facing some of the excessive, unnecessary discrimination native inspe inspections and pros prosecution, which they don't know what happened after that. They just like experience lots and lots, lots and lots of uh, infections and they don't feel uh, uh, respectful. So I'm gonna uh, read some of the concern of, of our, from our community. So they think the rapid increase of investigation really affect their jobs because sometimes they visit like three times a week and sometimes they interrupt their business and then sometimes they just go into the massage parlor without any knowledge Notice, but they will have the clients on site. So it's really like interrupt. Sometimes the, the clients don't feel satisfied with their job, so they just don't pay because the, there are like officers got in, but their service hasn't like finished. So they just like left and don't pay. They, they don't feel they don't feel good about that. And also we we, we believe from our uh, experience, some practitioners are treated disrespectfully without dignity and with assumptions of criminality during inspections. For example some of the bylaw officers will come and ask them to like stand stand there and don't move but like due to some of the language barrier they couldn't like uh, communicate uh, efficiently so they couldn't tell the officers uh, I'm going to take my uh, license because uh, some of them they will change to the different location they just put their license in the purse but they haven't had a chance to get it get it up and put on the wall. They just got there and the inspection officer come and then they said don't move. So they couldn't get it. So there is no clear guideline of the standard. So they don't know why I, I am being charged and they don't they don't know why I received this ticket and why this fight is like this. Thank you. Any questions to the deputant? Council one time. Yes, thank you. Um, Jaden, for your deputation. I want to clarify, um, you're coming here before this committee today to also uh, oppose the uh, the recommendations that are contained in this report, is that correct? Yeah. Okay, so you do not believe that, uh, that the recommendations are treating these five holistic uh, practitioner organizations uh, fairly. You believe that they've been singled out largely because of um, an exorbitant, um, an exorbitant number of, of uh, enforcements that have been placed directly upon them. Is that correct? 
No, I don't believe it. Yeah, because I believe some of the the organization, the fire organization, they don't even know that they are re being removed now. So that's why we, our in information is not transparency at all. And even is, yeah. And is it because of language barriers or maybe language barrier and, and accessible accessibility of the policy? We don't even have anybody to notice us. What? policy has been changed, uh, what kind of policy and what's the standard, what, what kind of policy and the rules we have to follow. Uh, every time the officer come and uh, they just get a ticket, but they don't have communication. Even sometimes uh, they are, charged, or are charging us, but like we don't know what's happening now. And is it because we locked the door, locked the door or is it because we locked the door without the sign or is it what happened? We don't know. We just got a ticket every so, time we got, go to the court. Yeah, and, and then and we so just paid a fine because we couldn't judge with the judge. So, Jaden, if I if I can ask you another question. So, uh, number one is that you don't feel the the enforcement has been fair. Is that correct? You you feel the enforcement has targeted uh, a, a particular group of of, uh, of practitioners, largely yeah. based on their race and their and perhaps their yes. language. Uh, abilities and they um, don't have chance to fight back and and so they don't have a chance to fight back and that's why you're opposing the recommendations today yeah so we need the consultation right away before we remove the five organizations so if perf if procedural fairness is not before us because the charges are disputable there are lots of a misunderstanding between both sides based on the fact that you believe that there has been excessive targeting of this racialized community, that's why you're opposing the recommendations. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Deputy Mayor. Yes, th three, Mr. Oh. Chair, and thank you for coming in today. So, uh, again, I, I think um, you're worried that one community is being targeted and other communities are, not, are being up maybe ignored or at least not targeted, correct? I don't really care about like, who's being like ignored or targeted. I just need the fair treatment to all the workers. Yeah. Right. Because now it seems like we don't have accessibility to all the information. Right. So we don't even know we are being ignored or targeted. How much is it? We just feel it like the investigation is getting increased every day and every time we don't have chance to fight back but it's not like this way of course that w i heard about like everybody talking about the human trafficking part but like we recognize this happening like in some of the parts we don't know yet but like this should not be the problem or the issue that can treat other workers like this way. Like we shouldn't like our policy should be reasonable, not just based on only based on the anti-trafficking. Then we should like targeting or like uh, investigate all the workers like searching their person or whatever. But they should be treated like as like regular workers. Yeah. But but do you understand that when our auditor general mm -hmm. did her investigation? She's not a police officer, she's an auditor general. Mm -hmm. When she did her investigation, these were the facts that she found. Mm -hmm. She didn't say, I'm, I'm um, targeting this one because of their ethnic race. She didn't know what their ethnicity was. But for our community members, they will feel they, they are targeted well, be, because maybe. they don't know, they just know that they come maybe every day, every week, three times a week. So. They may not know it, but do you understand that when our Auditor General goes through all her her investigation? Then we should let the journal uh, being public and transparent to our community members. Yes. Yeah. And if, if all these five organizations, by coincidence, were all from the European community or the South Asian continent or the South American community, should we then say then it's fair because some were South American and some were Eastern European and some were South Asian? The, but even just like focus on their ethnicity, but yes. we still have to look at the requirements and their like their standard, their rules. And then how does it impact the Chinese community? 
as I said, some of the culture of the Chinese community and the language barrier is different. Everybody has a different level of difficulty to like deal with the things. But like these five organizations, they, their main members might be the Chinese because maybe they teaching Chinese in the same, in a certain way, they can like uh, pass the information by the way they can understand. Okay. But yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. Excuse me, ma'am. Excuse me. Excuse me, Jaden. Jaden, you have uh, other questions, please. It's, uh, just hold on. Okay. Uh, Chair, through you to the uh, speaker, very quick question. Yeah. You said that in a, a store was targeted five times in a week? Three times in a week. Which one? I couldn't tell you which one because they are afraid of revenge. Sorry, you made the statement. Uh, oh, we know is... which one. We know exactly well, if who you can tell them. us which one, I would appreciate and it. And we couldn't tell you because we have okay. officers. Then if, if you can't tell us, then. They really can't. We have to protect our members. They really uh, Sorry, are scared you know, like about we, the revenge. We made a statement through the chair. I'd like to clarify which, 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 which location was it. You also made a statement that a lot of the doors of these locations are locked. Why are they locked? They didn't lock. Sometimes they just like the door is like you made locked. the statement it, that it's hard to, to push. Or like sometimes they have clients on site. They are talking to the clients. They are in the room, but like they just like couldn't make it in three or five seconds. Then then officer Sorry. said you lock the door. Chair, through you, they're talking to clients in the little cubicles, correct? But. You have to room. consider their language barrier. How can they like tell really clear to the clients? Oh, now here is the officer coming in and blah blah blah. It takes time. Sometimes they oh, need to use body nobody, language and to explain always, all the things happening. There's language on barrier site. at all these locations. Yeah. Okay, and you know of a location that was visited three times, but you won't be able to tell us. Yeah. And you also mentioned that the the, lo the doors most of the time are locked. Most of the time are locked. I'm not sure you, you tell me. No. Is it locked or I, not? I was saying sometimes they are charged by they lock the door. Yeah. But it's not the truth because they, sometimes the door is just like locked. It is hard to push, but they, could, they didn't lock. It's just hard to push. And sometimes it happens when they are talking to the clients and they heard somebody knocking the door and then couldn't get there right away to open. So they got ticket. And then couldn't explain to the officer, oh, now I'm talking to the clients in the room. It's just like three minutes or five minutes, so three, three seconds or five seconds difference. Thank you. Appreciate and they it. They couldn't you. make it. Thank you very much. Thank you. However, I would invite Any you if you want to take a walk with me on my 40 locations and we can go and visit each one of them and see how many of them are open. Would you like to do that? Yeah, we have, we have we'll already we'll ask visited one, a lot we'll of ask Ming Pao or Sing Tao to come with us. Would you like to do that? Oh, is, um, okay, we're done. And I do have one question for you is, um, and this is uh, related to Councilor Wan Tam's questions that, uh, that she has for you in terms of ethnicity. And I do know that, um, that we're not dealing only with South Asians, but also we have a large number of Brazilians, mm -hmm. Portuguese, Spanish, yeah, and um, so there is um, quite, quite a bit of diversity. So the, my question to you is in terms of the Auditor General's report, and uh, she's talking about the, PH, uh, the um, PHAs where 98% of the by-law charges and 90% of convictions had to do with those five PH, PHAs. Mm -hmm. And um, and she's not is talking about uh, an individual group, an individual ethnic community. It's an overall. So, wouldn't you agree that um, well, we are not targeting, or the city is not targeting anyone in particular, but because there is problems there, and that's why these recommendations were adopted by council. Wouldn't you agree with that? So that's why we need to do the consolation. 
before we make any decision of the policy. So now we're, we, ha we, are, we are trying to con connect with the uh, five PHA's owner and then to see what happened. And then we already know like majority of the members, they have the license from them. So they are Chinese people. So we're gonna find out what happened. And because, because now we already know that most of the people, they are Chinese already. Yeah. I don't buy that. So is, are you re perhaps um, insinuating that uh, the recommendations from the Auditor General should not, uh, we shouldn't be paying attention to it because so my recommendation is, is now we shouldn't to remove the five PHA now before we we do an, the consultation with our community members. Yeah, we need to know more, more details. Thank you. Caesar, Caesar, advise them once if they do it again, kick them out. We're not supposed to be clapping. So we have uh, number 13, uh, Jasmine Abuz Gaya, followed by Sean Yuen. And uh, Kenny Slim. So Jasmine Abuz Gaya, do we have Jasmine? Sean Yuen? Sean Yuen? Please have a seat, and uh, if you can uh, say your name, please. You, you name? Uh, my, my name is called Yun Sun Yin. I'm a small businessman. I want to tell you what happened to the Men and Women of the Men and Women of the Men and Women. I think I have the right to tell you what happened uh, in our work of massage parlor. So that is, is uh, a lot of like a misinformation and also like uh, wrong information to talk, uh, talk about us is uh, trafficking. You look like me if I, if I look like um, uh, being trafficked. Is it I look like a trafficker, tra trafficked 17 years old girl? Most of my uh, 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 staff actually is like 40 to 50 years old, so they're even older than me, so they are like an aunt. So, so that I, I want to tell you, so that I want to show you the tickets I got, so that to see how this policy and structure is racist. So that you can see there is a little small crack, even you cannot see it. Uh, so that I opened, uh, the, this business have been run for more than 10 years, there is have been no problem, but uh, like this, this year they have been like coming and this one, they, he need to pay a few hundred dollars for the fine. 实际工作中, 客人, but actually, when the people do massage, they cannot touch the, 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 the mats because there, was, uh, there will be a lot of towel cover on it. So that you, you pay attention, this is the picture from the fitness center. So that it can see that that is like selectively how to enforce the law. That is um, uh, insulting us with the wrong information. Yeah. So the other thing is we have a name card. So there, there is the information of the appointment with the client. So have, we have been running business for 10 years. There is no people tell them they need to have a license number. Why they give me a ticket? Because I don't have license number of my name card. I don't believe that any business in uh, Toronto, so that when they run the business, they need the license number in the name card. 
so that uh, you 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 make the mistake of the thing. 还有大家工作，每个人都不会把自己的生生日、住址、年龄写在墙上。So and anyone will not disclose their birthday or like the address or personal information on the wall. 你们要求我们必须贴在公共场合。But you need us to、uh, request to display on the public. 就已经证明了你们对我们不尊重。So that is very unrespectful to us. 前两年还有莱森局检察官员很友好的提示我们不必这样做，不用挂上。Actually, last two years we had the license come in to let us know we don't need to do it. Please wrap up now. I'm going to be a little bit. Okay. Yeah. 我想说最后一句。More seconds, please. 我能再说一句吗 ？Point of order. Just please hold. We are done. 我不，我不希望。I have a point of point of order. Okay. Point of order. Mr. Chair, because our deputy is using a translator, I think we should be extend his time because he's he spoken for a minute and a half, and and so is his. Yeah. Try. Let's let's get get on to it. Okay. Please please continue. Because you speak English, so you should have a strong accent. Thank you. Thank you. 呃，我不希望法律成为一个一个集体去打压另一个集体，种歧视另一个集体的工具。So I don't want the law become the system to use this system to oppress other like group of community. 我并不是在攻击那些制定法律的工作人员。I'm not going to attack this policy maker. 前天我们会见他们，很诚实的告诉了我们。So that we met them before and then tell us the truth. 现在的一些规定，他们都不是很确定，还要具体研究才能。Even the recent regulation, he asked them the question. Even they said they cannot give him the answer how the law being operate, and then they need to go back to like study and some of the particular like regulation. But you know, 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 是我们这些小小很艰难的工作的小 business 的 owner 在配为他们这些有可能的错误在买单。So is it we need to pay for the bill for their mistake?、Uh, we are the small businessman. Is it we need to pay for the bill for their mistake? 这是绝对不公平的。So this is very unfair. 将来呢，向往向来就是我我们中国都有追责制，工作用了追责制，追追查责任。Also, that we we in China we even have the accountability of the law enforcement officer. These police officers, these police officers, so now they make the mistake, and also like even that they still get the salary from the like um uh government. I think this is absolutely unfair. So that is very unfair. China will not happen like this. So even China will not happen like this. I hope I hope I hear every one. 制定法律的时候要本着公平，调查以后再去做任何的公正的法律。他 ，so he he said that so that any policy making need to be fair and then so any policy making before they need to do research and also consultation。不然的话，他们制定了就是仇恨。Thank you。So otherwise they only create a hate like the hostile relation。We are done. It's been.、Uh, I have given you an additional three times in、uh, three minutes. Thank you. Any questions? You're very generous, Mr. Chair. Please go ahead. Can I ask where the his his business is located? And your company is where? Chinatown. Chinatown. Downtown or Scarborough? Downtown. 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 Okay. Does he have any friends that got business up in Scarborough and they're facing the same difficulty? You have any friends that got business up in Scarborough and they're facing the same difficulty? You have any friends that got business up in Scarborough and they're facing the same difficulty? You have any friends that got business up in Scarborough and they're facing the same difficulty? You have any friends that got business up in Scarborough and they're facing the same difficulty? You have any friends that got business up in Scarborough and they're facing the same difficulty? You have any friends that got business up in Scarborough and they're facing the same difficulty? You have any friends at uh, like Markham, not being mayor. Markham, they don't have this kind of investigation. I've asked him if he's got any friends in Scarborough, not Markham. Scarborough. Scarborough. Has he he has got any friends in Scarborough? Uh, now I hear that it's also like this. So that's they. He heard that it's also like this in Scarborough. Does he have? Does he know of any particular store in Scarborough that faces the same difficulty? You, you have you heard that there are some people who have similar stories in Scarborough? Um, I don't know. You said something specific. No. He don't know what you mean about the story. What do you mean? Does he know of any locations, any business, any stores, or any apartments or any houses in Scarborough that are facing the same difficulty as he is? Same. 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 Same.
Almost everyone. Almost, Almost everyone. everyone? Yes. Like Tulip Spa, Happy Happy Spa, are they complaining also? Like on Finch and Kennedy, on McNichol and uh, Pharmacy, are they also complaining? Do you know of them? I'm not so sure, but his friend is uh, uh -huh. experienced the same experience. Where is his friend's business? Can he tell us? Huh? Where is his friend's his business? Uh, Dangtang and uh, Scarborough. Where in Scarborough? He's, uh, uh, he's mainly located at Dangtang. He said in Scarborough. The location in Scarborough, the intersection. So that he said that mainly is uh, downtown. Yeah. Mainly downtown. You don't know about like the Scarborough. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. So he, he said like uh, he wants to say something. I said he is very angry because you guys this kind of policy is target on us okay, as that's not one of my person. questions, but I thank him. Okay. Yes, yes. You don't talk about another star. Yes. I just say my star. Yes. I never do any Oh English break the law. Yeah. Because I'm hungry. Excellent. I'm so hungry now. Excellent. You Excellent. see the note of my question. You ask another one. Thank you, I sir. I don't care. I appreciate it. What they Thank do. you. I just don't care. Your policy. Thank Excuse you. me. Excuse me. Is we okay? Thank you. Is um, thank you. Any other? Thank any you, other sir. questions? Thank you. Okay. Well, that's, we're done. That's, we're done. That's his. Is, um, and the last deputant that we have for the day is uh, Kenneth Lin. Please go here. Practitioners have signed a petition after the city released a misleading and problematic information in the audit report. As a white person, I see it as my responsibility to speak back against these recommendations and practices which predominantly impact racialized newcomer women. There are many holistic practitioners who don't feel safe to speak due to backlash that they have already experienced from law enforcement and city officials. However, many of them have either been here or they had to leave due to the, the time restrictions. Today, the holistic practitioners would like to urge the mayor, the city council, and members of the licensing and standards committee to hear their voices. Here are quotes from workers. Jenny Wang, Juan Li, Amy Liu, Sean Yuan, Amanda Liu, Jade, Na Li, and Christian Chen. These particular quotes speak to problematic experiences with Ba Lai enforcement officers and police. Tears cannot change the law. And the law enforcement is becoming more abusive when we stay silent. Now, Holistic Practitioners Alliance represents us to have our voices heard by city councillors. The unfair regulations have to be changed, and that's fundamental. We need a fair and pleasant work environment, and that is a reasonable request. I was just focusing on doing my work, but the bylaw enforcement officers treated us like we were criminals. Licensing expense, it, in, inspects us too many times. It has caused a lot of stress to female workers. The inspection also harasses the, the customers. The licensing Balai official authority people say for a very long time and they abuse their power to the extreme. If they're in a good mood, they won't issue a ticket. Otherwise, they'll find fault with you somehow. Sometimes they come with six or seven people, making both the neighbors and clients uncomfortable. It really affects our business and results in the neighborhood not liking us. If massage practitioners like us do not quickly open the door within three to five seconds, we will get a ticket for not opening the door. They are very unreasonable and disrespectful. A female officer asked my coworker to take off her clothes and show her underwear. The bylaw enforcement officer then took photos of her and gave her a ticket for having unprofessional clothing. They search my place without a warrant, take out my underwear, and touch the items one by one. It is really insulting. I made a complaint, but they took revenge. They came back and issued tickets to me and ordered my clients to leave. The next set of quotes speaks to problems with the bylaws of holistic centers. 
Times are changing and society is moving forward. The regulations and laws that are out of date should be abolished and regulated. For example, requiring customers to register their personal information and issuing receipts mandatorily. These are not reasonable, meaning it is unlawful to force the customers to provide personal information that infringes on their privacy, forcing them to accept receipts that are unnecessary. <coughs> the massage parlor door must be locked. This rule must be resolved, repealed. The massage staff can access a safety situation at work and choose to lock the door. These quotes speak to accountability of bylaw enforcement officers and police. It isn't only Canada. Every country has agencies to work for women to ask for equality and freedom and for non-discrimination against them. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has contributed $100 million to the UN to help women suffering discrimination in poor countries to enhance their Thank social you. status. You're Why does staff. licensing at City of Toronto treat us like this? Thank you, ma'am. Questions? Thank you for your presentation. And thank you for speaking to us. Questions to the staff? Yeah, we're going to stop now. Questions to staff and uh, V3 members. Council, one time. Uh, yes, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, through you. Um, the, the recommendations before us, uh, how, how, how important is it that these recommendations be adopted today, given what we've heard from the, uh, the speakers? Um, <clears throat> the recommendations brought forward today is, uh, is for us as staff um, really looking at this. We are not stopping uh, this activity from continuing. What we are doing is acting upon um, the AG report from November. Um, we're also looking at our own data and uh, what it supports is, is a time for a pause and to stop the proliferation of uh, of the additional holistic uh, practitioners coming in into these five areas, which we have found to be problematic, and so do the AG. But, but there is no reason why we can't pause it today, given what we've heard, um, especially in light of the, uh, of, the, of the very serious allegations that could uh, cross the line around criminal acts, uh, sexual violence and assaults, and perhaps inappropriate uh, application of enforcement from our bylaw officers. Um, does it not give us a, a, a legitimate reason to pause, to, to dig further, to, to understand what is being said by the deputants and evaluate it based on what is not in the report, uh, which, are, which, are, which are allegations of, of abuse of, uh, of, from bylaw officers? So what, what we are, you're right, uh, there is a number of outstanding pieces and a, a lot of work that we still need to do on this, a, a lot of research. Uh, this report lays out the framework and a work plan to do a lot of the consultation that has been requested here today. Uh, we plan on doing that. We plan on being comprehensive and as thorough as we are. This was an opportunity to, to act upon um, a couple of outstanding requests from this council. Um, to act on this. It came up in the budget uh, discussions as well. There are a number of outstanding directives on this as well as the AG's report and that's why this report is here before you today. But we could realistically, re I mean we could realistically not uh, stop you from carrying out your work plan to review the, uh, the regulatory framework at the same time still take a moment to uh, to, to investigate and, and to give uh, proper consideration to the very serious allegations that were made uh, uh, from the, uh, the speakers. Um, you, and you can still carry forward that body of work as long as we don't necessarily just adopt the recommendations and, uh, and, and have you move forward as if we didn't hear anything today. Like we could do both. We, you could carry out your work plan and, and still give these, uh, these deputants and, and these uh, speakers uh, proper consideration of what they've said. Yeah, that's a, that's a fair point. Uh, we're willing to take direction from the committee on uh, however you want us to proceed. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much. Councillor Bernstein. Through you to staff. Okay, so a couple things. Um, you've listed five holistic uh, centers, um, but I think the Auditor General's report, did it not mention 10? It mentioned 10, yes, that's right. correct. Okay, and uh, I, I, from reading the report, I understand the rationale for the five is that 97 or 98 percent of the charges were with those, with those uh, five. 
related to those five. That seems like a that's, cor that's, that's correct, and that's why we recommended uh, moving forward at this time with okay. the those are the charges on right. the five. Right, those are the charges. But if, uh, if the Auditor General has identified 10 that are um, uh, outside of the norm, uh, or the standards that we think are acceptable, why would we not include them as well, given that uh, it would just seem like a logical thing for someone, if they were licensed under one of the five that's prohibited, to move over to the other five? So the Auditor General, through her work, uh, reviewed the top ten. Um, they found discrepancies amongst those. Uh, our comfort level w is with the top five because it's completely supported by our charges and convictions. Okay. Um, so now, uh, my colleague mentioned about um, defer, I think it was a deferral, right? It's a refer back. Refer back, okay, thanks. Um, uh, because of her concerns, if, and correct me if I'm paraphrasing you incorrectly, um, her concerns with uh, allegations made by some of the deputants, is that correct? That's what the Actually, that's yeah. what Councillor okay. Wong Time is okay. suggesting. Um, allegations, and I think some of them were of criminal wrongdoing. Um, that would um, I'm not sure if I understand the relationship between that and um, these five that are acting outside of the normal boundaries. Like, like in in the police world, if there are allegations of criminal wrongdoing against officers, that is a different. Um, issue. Through, through Mr. Chair, um, I'll jump in. Yeah, I completely agree with uh, uh, what you're saying. If there is allegations of, of inappropriate behavior by uh, individual enforcement officers, that's a completely different matter than what's before you. What's before you is a policy matter uh, that we're looking at, reviewing uh, how we regulate and, and go about providing licenses to particular establishments. Um, if if uh, we have a separate meeting on, on um, direct allegations of employees. Uh, you that's know, a difference, okay. Completely right. different, it's not a policy matter, that's, so, that's a, a discipline matter that we'd have to look at. Right, first. thank you. So I have four seconds to ask my last question, which then brings me back to your answer uh, through, um, through the chair to uh, Carlson. Um, do you want to rephrase your answer to Councillor Wong Tam? I'm not a rephrase, what I was saying is we did hear a number of things today. We are comfortable with our, the recommendations we've put forward, that's why they're here. My name is on the report. I stand by what's in the report. Um, it's up to the committee around the inner circle to decide um, if they support that referral or not. Thank you. I'm comfortable with uh, the recommendations put forward. Thank you. Deputy Mayor, you're next, please. Uh, thank you. Through you, uh, Mr. Chair, and I'm, I know I'm talking to behind me, but I'll, I'll uh, um, ask that would you agree that some of the deputations who came today were really talking about something that's not before us today? They're talking about their concerns of um, racial profiling or targeting a specific ethnic group or inappropriate behavior by inspectors. That's, our report's not dealing with that today. Am I correct? That's correct. This is really a work plan for the further work we need to do on this particular bylaw. <coughs> So the uh, concerns that have been um, brought forward today, have you ever heard concerns like that before in this field about some of our City of Toronto um, inspectors who I'm assuming would report to yourself? I'll de defer that to my colleague who they do report to, uh, Rod Jones, the Director of Bylaw Enforcement. So through the Chair, we met last week, um, courtesy of uh, Councillor Wong Tam, with some of the folks that um, presented today. and for my first time, heard some of these allegations. Um, they were stated in generalities. Um, I took them very seriously and requested um, that if there was a specific allegation or a specific incident, that we would investigate it fully as a workplace matter. And uh, if it did involve a criminal allegation, that we re would refer it to the Toronto Police. So then, uh, again, so some of the, you know, there is the, I, I think, I heard from maybe three or more deputants, and I, I believe it may have been the same incident, them saying there was an, a, a woman inspector who told one of the women to take off some of her clothes, to look at her undergarments. Did, was that brought forward to you? 
Uh, through the chair, that was one of the um, allegations that was mentioned. Uh, again, I don't have the specifics. Um, I can tell you from uh, personally uh, attending with my officers that a common practice is when the uh, inspectors uh, try to gain entry into some of these locations, there is a, for lack of better words, mad dash to put on clothing. Um, it's usually outer garments, um, coats, robes, uh, oftentimes misbuttoned uh, to cover up um, what the holistic practitioners are wearing um, as the bylaw states that they have to be professionally attired. It's a, it's a mechanism to uh, try to um, mask what they're wearing. And through Madam, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, I know this is, uh, I'll take your, uh, straying from this specific, because what's before us and the accusations are, I think, two separate things. But um, my understanding is that um, there are people from many parts of the world in this industry, from every continent on this planet. Would that be a fair statement? Not just the Chinese community, but there's South Americans, Western Europeans, Eastern Europeans, South Asians, Africans, every Martians. continent in the world is probably here doing in this business. Uh, that's a fair statement. Okay, great, thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Thank you, uh, Chair, through you to staff. Uh, what do we have in front of us today is asking you to do work and report back. Is that correct? Uh, what it outlines is a, is a roadmap uh, of work that we have to do over the next uh, 8 to 12 months and report back. In the interim, it, it allows us to pause and um, not allow the issuance of further uh, holistic practitioners um, licenses uh, in the interim. Also, Chair, you want to set the time right? Oh, okay, Sorry. fine, that's fine. Uh, in, the, in the meantime, it also allows you to hear from people that made deputations today and accusations and, and, and whatever was out there and communities being targeted. This will be something of the work that you will be doing in the next year or whatever it is. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, we've made contacts with uh, many of the people that have spoken today and we will be reaching out to them in the future. Um, through you, Chair, to uh, the person that's in, in, in responsible for bylaw enforcement of that particular segment. You mentioned that there's a mad dash when your bylaw uh, uh, officer knocks at the door? Uh, through the Chair, yes, that's a, a, a pretty common occurrence that uh, the uh, holistic practitioners uh, will try to um, put on uh, extra layers of clothing to um, avoid being charged with not being professionally dressed. So there is, there's, there's more there going on than just holistic practitioners. I can't hear myself. Uh, through the chair, yes. Um, we have uh, done investigations and have found that services other than those that have been licensed um, are being offered, um, advertised, and, uh, and, and uh, performed at some of these locations. Would you um, be able to, uh, to, to either to confirm or deny that a lot of these holistic locations or spas that are advertised, they have pictures of, on the website of, of um, women in, in pretty um, um, showing? Chair, uh, really, I appreciate this. I mean, you know, like, Put my time on hold and ask the councillors either to return to the desk or for me to leave. And uh, I mean, I'm trying to ask questions. I was respectful of when you were doing There is a little bit of asking, and I, and I appreciate Councillor Karichanis that you're bringing this to my attention because you do the same respectfully. Please continue. Thank you. Have you found that there's pictures with women with little or no clothing, uh, clothing that is enticing on their websites that suggest that they also provide other services? Uh, through the chair, I, I can confirm that uh, as part of our investigation, we do do online research. Uh, we do look at uh, open source information that would be on the inter internet, and there is evidence of um, that type of, uh, of advertising um, that is fairly prominent in the industry. Last question that I have, Chair, is should we be asking a provincial or a federal jurisdiction government to look at these 37, 38 associations and bring them under one umbrella, which is self-regulating, 
um, is able to uh, throw people out of, can we ask for that? Is that something that's feasible? Uh, I'd imagine it's feasible, it's something we can look at. I'm not sure um, definitively if it can be done or not. Legal, anything? Corey? Yeah, I, I, certainly, I certainly think it's possible that a, a higher level of government could set up a regulatory regime for this sort of thing, uh, for a self-licensing body. That's something that can be explored and, and requested. Something like the immigration consultants a few years back, and they were brought all under the um, Upper Canada Law Society, something along those lines. Certainly, and there's definitely options uh, for our more senior levels of government to uh, provide regulations. Thank, thank you. Any other questions? If not, I have a couple of quick questions. This um, topic has been under the radar since 2011 in terms of trying to correct the wrongs from the past as it relates to the mainly the illegal uh, radio body parlors. And um, so my question to you is in terms of the recommendations from the Auditor General is given her recommendations as well, you are trying to put the brakes for now, to asking for moratorium, to consult and to come back with the report. Is that the intention? That is the intention, Chair. So this report, listening from deputants, that um, it doesn't have to do anything with race, ethnicity, and uh, as it's being alleged, because I'm very concerned with that aspect as well. So I just want to make sure that uh, we are using, uh, that's not the angle that the city is taking anyway whatsoever. Can you please uh, elaborate on that? By no means are we taking that angle. Great, thank you. So we'll get to uh, speakers and um, these hearing members. Just one time. Please go ahead, three minutes. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. If I can ask the clerk to please uh, put the, uh, the motion onto the screen, and mm -hmm. hopefully I could have a member here take carriage of it. Uh, the motion is simply to refer this item back to the executive director uh, of MLS and to continue to cons do consultations with the professional holistic associations while carrying out the work plan, not disrupting their work, to finish the comprehensive review of Chapter 545. Um, Mr. Chair, I have great concerns about some of the, uh, the remarks that were said today on uh, from the deputants. Um, I can't think of a, a time where a bylaw officer will walk through a venue to inspect a property three to four times uh, a week. Quite honestly, I can't get a bylaw officer to come and visit the parks when we need to, to call them. I can't get a bylaw officer to investigate noise or a dog off leash area that's run rogue. But yet they've been able to find themselves in the same establishment three to four times a week. And so when I hear the, uh, the deputants, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, speak about uh, feeling targeted, uh, feeling that they are being harassed, um, it, it does raise some alarm bells for me because it doesn't reconcile, uh, based on what I know, the volume of activity from bylaw officers in every other field in Toronto that they have jurisdiction. Um, what I also have concerns uh, about, Mr. 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 Chair, is the, the fact that we have um, folks who are predominantly of the Chinese-Canadian background, whose English is not their first language, who are speaking through interpreters, who are sharing their lived experience and telling us at this committee that they feel, based on all their observations and their lived experience, is that they are being targeted and discriminated against, and they're saying that they're being violated. Their human rights are being violated. Their civil rights are being violated. That tells me, Mr. Chair, that we need to pause this process, not pausing the work, but pause this particular recommendation, the report, so that we can actually do some deeper investigation and find out, is there truth in what is being said? Because if there is, and I can't think of a reason why there isn't, but if there is, 
we need to at least do our due diligence. And by, by pushing this report through, I don't think that we are. The Auditor General did a paper, the Auditor General did a paper audit on did somebody fill out their paperwork correctly? And get, you know, if you put paperwork in front of my parents now in English, even though they've been in the country for 30 plus years, I'm gonna tell you right now, uh, they will fill out those forms wrong. And that's not because they're not good people and they're not crooks, it's just because English is still not their first language and they're still struggling after all these years. I have been able to learn the language, they have not. And I don't feel like there's anything wrong with us being being careful in how we move through this particular stage of, of this body of works, considering what we've heard today. Thank, Thank you very much. Any other speakers? Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'll, I'll certainly move that motion on behalf of Councillor Wong Tam if, if it's necessary. I know you usually do as a, as a matter of courtesy, but uh, I won't be supporting that motion, however, because I think the concerns that I've heard raised today by some of the workers are separate and segregated and distinct from what this report says to us today. So I, I'm, I'm comfortable with the report. I'm comfortable that our Auditor General had no racial bias when she looked up these companies. She didn't know who owned them. She didn't know what gender they were. She didn't know their sexual orientation. She didn't know their language. She didn't know anything about them. What she knew was there was a, uh, a company name and address, et cetera, et cetera. She went to look for those and found out that they were um, apparently fraudulent or shell companies or companies that were um, doing things illegally. The Auditor General did her do uh, job um, uh, blind to the fact of who it may be at the other end of that application. And I, uh, you know, I, I think these companies uh, do employ a lot of people. They are, uh, for the legal activities they do, they are legal activities, they're permitted activities, they generate, I assume, a lot of money, and I'm pretty sure when people, uh, if they ever give them their debit cards or their visa cards, will get those numbers correct. They'll know how to make deposits into the bank. They'll know how to keep track of all the hours of all their employees, how many customers each one, what services are provided to each customer, how much revenue is generated, what percentage to decimal place is, is for the owner versus the worker. So I, I think people who can do all of that, including importing people uh, into the country to provide these services, people who can do all that uh, should be able to fill out a form for the City of Toronto to say where their business address is. So I, I see the, the issues as separate. Uh, the concerns, again, that I've heard today about our inspectors are, are very serious accusations. I um, uh, encourage Councillor Wong Tam and congratulate her for sitting down with her staff and bringing people together. Uh, and I'm sure all of us will, and the chair of this committee will, to make sure that all people in this city are treated with respect and dignity because every person in the city res re deserves respect and dignity. So if there are accusations, they need to be followed up. And if in the end, it's, I'll call it an urban legend, that five people talk about the same incident, but nobody can actually find where that incident happened, uh, or who that was, or what happened, then it's very difficult for us to analyze. But uh, I think we should, our staff should be, um, um, uh, carriage, and I think they already are uh, looking in, into these matters. And if there's uh, things they need to report back to us, or if there are things that are wrong, they should be brought out to the full light of day for all of uh, all of us to see, investigate, discuss, and resolve in a successful matter. Thank you. Thank you, you. Councillor Burnside. Um, thank you. Through you, I won't be supporting the motion. Um, to me, it's a real stretch to say that. Um, faulty paperwork is, is the issue in, in a language barrier. This is not an individual. This isn't a supposed asso professional association. Okay, and I think that is, is, is key to this. It's a professional association. If they can't get paperwork right, how professional are they? Uh, the Auditor General's report, uh, I, I believe, was, was, was uh, a little more in depth than what is being um, portrayed. My other concern is that, um, while issues have been raised by, uh, by deputants, I, I asked staff, and uh, through, the, um, through um, Mr. De Geronimo, uh, and it was confirmed that these are two separate issues. Wrongdoing is one thing. Whether there was wrongdoing or not, these recommendations are a totally separate 
issue. And my biggest concern, and I don't normally jump to the defense of staff, um, I think they can largely take care of themselves, but my biggest concern is this allegation, with all due respect, of some sort of harassment because people have been visited three times and the assertion that nowhere else does this happen. Well, I can, I can tell you 20 people in Leaside who feel harassed because parking people come by three times in a week or myself walking my dog through a park where there's been a complaint, where there's an issue, staff come in for a week or two and there's heavy enforcement, three, four, five, six times a week. So to say that it's unusual at these particular um, holistic centers, if you will, in my opinion is totally baseless. This is actually, uh, from my three and a half years experience, with the city is what our bylaw people do. They identify a problem and then there's a level of enforcement. It's not just a one-off, it's two, three, four, five times. It could be walking your dog in the park or parking on the street. Thank you. Vice Chair Kajanis. Thank you, I do have two motions if staff can put them up. Uh, one is, um, is asking city um, council request the federal and provincial government to uh, look at uh, amalgamating the 37 <laughs> professional holistic associations and self-regulate them to form an association to oversee all others. And the second motion is that... Chair. Yeah. Listening, please go Thank ahead. Thank you. And the second motion is that we ask the uh, executive director to report back by July the 6th on the feasibility of revoking the licenses of licensed body rob partners and holistic centers in the city of Toronto that have bylaw charges and convictions incurred. Chair, we've listened with great interest to people here today um, giving us um, what is happening. Uh, I have difficulty um, um, fathoming the fact that. Uh, that our staff is not professional. I've seen the bylaw officers, and not all the time do I agree with them, but a lot of times they're very professional, they're very courteous, and I want to thank Kristen Wong Tam, Councillor Wong Tam, for not allowing me to speak. I really thank you, really appreciate it. Um, I was courteous when you were going at it. I want to thank our staff for the work that they're doing. I believe that um, some of the allegations are very far-fetched. The only thing that you have to do is go in areas where we have these body rub parlors. Go in the back and see what kind of cars the owners of the body rub parlors drive and see what the people that work there under what conditions they're there. A lot of the, um, I've been advised that a lot of the individuals that work in those, uh, uh, in those uh, shops, in those uh, premises, are people that are um, come to Canada and they're being trafficked. Um, and the people that own those stores drive BMWs, Mercedes-Benz, SUVs, expensive SUVs, and they live in expensive homes, while the people that work in those locations live into rooming houses and they're in danger. So I would say to you, and I want to thank the deputants for coming here today and really make the presentations, I would say to you that uh, we need to deal with this and we need to deal with this and, and send the request. And if it need be, that we might even tell the federal government to start in looking at uh, legalizing prostitution as they did with marijuana. This is one of the challenges that will, might, they might have to face. Thank you, Chair. Question, uh, questions to the mover? Thank uh, you. Councilor um, Versailles. Uh, th through you, uh, Mr. Chair. Isn't it putting the cart before the horse when we're, we're, we, well, with your second motion, I actually agree, but in terms of the feasibility of, first of all, people on charges aren't convicted, but apart from that, isn't it, isn't, it putting the cart before the horse before, you know, there's still a lot of um, work needed to be done by staff and to start revoking licenses midstream, wouldn't that be I'm, I'm bad asking, practice? I'm asking for a report back. I'm accepting the executive director's recommendation to you or to you. I'm asking for a report back. Okay, thanks. Is, I do have a question with regards to recommendation number three. And uh, yeah, is. Uh, you're asking that the city, st okay. city staff to report back on July the 6th, 2018. Now, is, do we understand that uh, this is, uh, the whole review is part of the bigger picture overall that city staff has to go out and consult and come back with all the pieces. So there is a lot of variables to the question there that they have to 
fall into place. And by telling city staff, I'm, I, I'm not telling. I'm asking for your point. We are preempting that won't be possible. So my question to you is: If we take the the um, timing out, we are still they are still coming back with that report, including what you are asking for. Would you if, take if you that? want to make a friendly amendment, I'd be, I'd be okay with it. So you are okay with that? So I'll make that friendly amendment just okay. to take the date out. All right. Is that okay? Great. Other speakers? If not, uh, I'm going to say a few words. It's, uh, to me, this is, uh, it sounds deja vu once again. In 2011, and I'm going to refer respectfully to one of the deputants here, that's Tim Lambrinos, who was here, and this room was thoroughly packed with more than 200 people, and we were dealing with exactly with the same situation, exactly with the same situation, and I wanted to share with you, Councillor one time, in a very friendly way. Is, uh, the, the problem was the same. We heard the same arguments over and over again from the industry, from everywhere. And uh, yes, the remarks were all over that we are targeting minority groups and uh, that the city was biased and whatever else. There were groups at that point and uh, that were, I happened to speak Spanish, being I'm Spanish, groups that were Spanish as well that were complaining Portuguese, Brazilians, from all over. So in my opinion, there is no way or whatsoever that either the Auditor General or our city staff is targeting anyone because of their background. There is, in my opinion, there is no such a thing. They have done due diligence to the highest degree, and my hat's off to them for doing that. So it's, um, and I'm not referring to, and I think nothing has been said in terms of referring to the legal business that they're offering, offering the traditional medicine, the holistic wellness, the shiatsu centers that we have out there that deal with professional trained individuals that they work between nine and five. And uh, the question here is cracking down on the unlicensed, the illegal business that are creating problems out there. So, and what we are saying, and what our communities are saying, and I'm saying it to you in a very respectful way, is that, for example, at the local level, what my community is saying is, Caesar, for God's sakes, what are you doing? And we are talking about a commercial strip, St. Clair, with residential units north and south of St. Clair that are affected tremendously by the level of of uh, negative impacts that comes along with people that frequent these locations. And it's not only whatever is happening behind the scenes there, but all the illegal aspects. So we have locations that where there has been a number of charges, convictions, and the question is what do we do next? So the problem continues to proliferate. So I think what uh, needs to be done is uh, I think that uh, to simply to, to do what City Council did. City Council unanimously, I believe that uh, endorsed the recommendations of the Auditor General. So, and the recommendations of the Auditor General were very clear that we have these, um, these uh, PHAs that somehow are part of the problem. So what we are doing is putting the brakes on it now we're having a moratorium and to give an opportunity to city staff to just to go back and just to revisit what needs to be done and to come back once again. And I'm sure that all the stakeholders are going to be part of the discussion. So this is not targeting anyone in terms of ethnicity in any way whatsoever. And, uh, and I, for that reason alone, I will not be supporting the recommendation from my dear colleague, Councillor Wantam, because we've been at it for too many years, and I think that's time to, for us to, to take this seriously. And that's one way of creating a healthy industry as well. We really have to work with everyone and just to take one step further and, uh, and move forward. Thank you. So we, we do have we do have uh, some recommendations. The first recommendation is uh, from uh, 
and uh, the deputy mayor and uh, the premier. I have two motions I'd like to move. One is on behalf of Councillor Wong Tam, yeah. uh, which is the def a referral, I believe. Uh, I, I, again, I personally won't be supporting it, but as a courtesy, no. I think Mr. No, no, I, I, that. I will have done the same, yeah. Chance to speak. Yeah, I'm speaking. So, let's go, you're not speaking. Yeah, it's, uh, so we have. Uh, oh, I had, so I, I thought I was just moving motions now. I spoke, yeah. but okay. Because yeah, there was another motion just to ask the. Yeah, we're, so we're voting on those, yeah. Okay. If we can uh, display, please, the motions. Just hold on this. It's, um, did you, you, you didn't speak to this, to this motion? This was not moved. This was, uh, no, no, this motion was not, was not moved. And we have, so, so this one is, is not in there. No, no, you did move uh, Councillor West Downs, but no, I didn't move <laughs> yours. And I spoke already, so we went through the speaking part. So at this point, you might be able maybe just to move it at City Council. Yeah. Council, the committee can turn on it. It's, um, and, uh, you know, one, one of the things that I'm going to ask the members of the committee at this point, I think that, um, if um, the deputy mayor wants to introduce the motion, I think that we are very flexible from that perspective. I'll be more than glad to do that. Is point of point of order, chair? Yes. I think this is out of order. The, the, we spoke, and this was not introduced. We didn't have a chance to do it. We finished speaking. Sir, this cannot be introduced. It's not. Uh, it's not. Jimmy, I made an, I made a mistake. And just okay. It's, so are you the committee, it's to up to the committee to decide either to allow it or not to allow. So. Yeah. That's that's correct. Yeah, yeah. That's what I'm doing. Okay. So. So we have the the motion that I'm putting forward is I'm putting a motion forward that. So my motion that I'm putting forward is to allow uh, the deputy mayor, the Vera maker, to introduce his motion at this point. All those in favor? Okay. Now we have the motion before us. Okay, so now all those in favor of the motion that's before us? No, no. Yes. The referral goes first. Oh, the referral. Yes. So we have the referral. Yeah. Did in fact move oh, you had the referral first, yes. Did yeah, absolutely. So this is that. Um, no, this is okay. So this is on behalf of, uh, yeah. All those in favor of the motion before us now? Yeah, the deferral. All those in favor of the deferral? Recorded vote. Recorded vote. Against? Councillors Burnside, De Vermeke, Carijanes, and Palacio. And then we have the next motions. So, so this is a request that city council requests the federal and provincial governments. So, okay. okay. All those in favor? Against? Carries. The next one is motion number three from uh, Councilor Carijanis. So on this one, the date was taken out. All those in favor? Against? Carries. And there is, I believe, another motion there. And this is, uh, yeah, this is the deputy mayors. Uh, 
is I'm just going to ask a serious staff on this one in, in terms of the timing. Okay, so we have this motion. All, all those in favor? Against? It carries. So we have another motion there. No, no, not yet. So we have. Do the item as yeah. We have one more uh, no. motion number two from Council Number three now. That's the only one that has Just hold on for a second. No, no, we're not done yet. So we have the item now. The item as amended. Adopt as amended. All those in favor. Against, carry. Now, in, uh, members of council, we have another motion that needs to be introduced. That's the one that I spoke this morning. That's before you. And the recommendations are very clear on this one. So I would like to move the recommendations. All those in favor? Against, carry. Thank you. And a motion to adjourn. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.